C-SPAN. Now an oversight hearing on the Troubled Asset Relief Program known as TARP. It was created last year in response to instability in financial markets. The TARP Special Inspector General Neil Borofsky is calling for more transparency in the program. This is a little more than two and a half hours. Good morning. Thank you for being here. The Trouble Asset Relief Program, known as TARP, has evolved into a program of unprecedented scope, scale, and complexity. TARP funds are being used in connection with 12 separate programs, under which Treasury has already committed $643 billion and spent $441 billion. Today we will hear from the Special Inspector General for TARP, Neil Borowski. As he presents his quarterly report to Congress, his findings, quite frankly, are astonishing. According to the IG, the TARP has become a program in which taxpayers, number one, are not being told that TARP recipients are doing what TARP recipients are doing with their money. Number two, have not been told what their investments are worth. And number three, will not be told the full details of how their money is being invested. He found that even though Treasury receives monthly reports on the value of TARP investments, it will not make that information public. Incredibly, the Treasury Department has taken the position that it will not even ask TARP recipients what they are doing with the taxpayers' money. In short, the taxpayers now have a $700 billion spending program that's being run under the philosophy of don't ask, don't tell. However, the committee has been asking a lot of questions about last fall's financial meltdown and its consequences. And the key question is this, are these programs being run for the benefit of the American taxpayers who are funding them or for the benefit of Wall Street? That's a question. Without more transparency in these programs, we cannot answer that question for sure. But what we have learned from the IG is not encouraging. Treasury has hired nine private firms to be asset managers for the public-private investment program. All of these large firms are engaged in extensive private investment activities. According to the Special IG, this arrangement is vulnerable to conflicts of interest, collusion, and money laundering. Yet Treasury is allowing these firms to share information between employees who make investment decisions on behalf of the government and those who manage private funds. This arrangement is further indication that federal financial regulation is a bit too cozy with Wall Street. Meanwhile, lending to American businesses and consumers remain weak. Some firms claim to have used TARP funds to increase lending, but others have used it to acquire other businesses or show up their own balance sheets and then award bonuses to employees. There is no evidence that Treasury has made any attempt to determine whether TARP funding has resulted in increased lending and whether that has had any effect on reducing unemployment. I also want to voice my deep concern over recent news that Treasury has requested a legal opinion from the Department of Justice challenging the Special Inspector General's independence. Congress would not have established a Special Inspector General to oversee the TARP if all we wanted was a yes man or yes woman that Treasury could ignore. It is critical that oversight investigations and audits of TARP remains unencumbered. Congress may have given Treasury some leeway when it comes to the TARP, but we didn't give them a blank check. The problem is we can't even say whether the TARP programs are working or not, because the information that would allow Congress and the taxpayers to analyze whether they are getting a good return on their investments has not been made available. I hope today's hearing and the Special IG's report will be a wake-up call to the Treasury and the Fed that our financial system cannot be run behind closed doors. Again, I want to thank Mr. 
Borowski for appearing today, and I look forward to his testimony. At this time, I yield time to the ranking member from the great state of California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for this vigorous oversight. As you have said so often, all we ask for is transparency. Today we will hear that all we are not getting is transparency. Mr. Chairman, uh, because I am going to include them in my opening statement, I would like to ask unanimous consent that three pieces be put in the record. The first, Mr. Chairman, is your letter to Tim Geithner asking that, uh, that he uh, in specifically include the recommendations of the special IG, something which I am not sure there is an answer, but it is from February 5th. The second is yesterday's New York, I guess today's New York Times, that says big estimate worth little on bailout. I suspect that that will be referred to many times today. And the third, because it is related to TARP, and to a case recently settled against the government, I have a letter in response to a letter from myself in which the Chairman has been copied from uh, Maurice Hank Greenberg concerning, considering, concerning his continued willingness to arbitrate rather than to litigate uh, the disputes which so far he has been winning. That objection is so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we are going to hear about a $23.7 trillion figure related to the TARP. Additionally, we are going to hear that the full transparency which we asked for, which this President and this Administration has promised, is being blocked by the bureaucracy that often seems to say, just trust us and we will deliver. Now, just trust us and we will deliver, quite frankly, and I am not making the comparison except for the purpose uh, of people understanding why we can't trust. Bernie Madoff said, trust us, we have high returns. The fact is, Treasury is saying, trust us, you really don't have $23.7 trillion at risk. As a matter of fact, effectively they are saying the only thing that is at risk is a fraction of the $700 billion that we have committed. Mr. Chairman, nothing could be further from the truth. Over my decades in business, one thing I learned was insurance policies cost money because the amount insured is, in fact, at risk. Anyone who thinks that we mark to market assets to half of their original value uh, with some regularity when they include toxic assets and written down homes and then believes that there would be no risk in guaranteeing those, particularly Freddie and Fannie and other guarantees that are out there, is simply living in a dream world. If we underwrite in various forms over $23 trillion, we will, in fact, have losses. There are no gains for all practical purposes in these assurances, so they are not offset by profits. In the case of the TARP directly, and I know we are going to hear from the Special IG today, there will be some good news. There already has been some return and some profit on monies extended in the TARP. That is not so of our many of our guarantees. Most of our guarantees are, in fact, insurance without cost to both profit and nonprofit organizations. Mr. Chairman, I believe that this administration desperately wants the kinds of transparency that will allow us to uncover potential insider trading, cozy relationships be between part of a, uh, a trading organization which is trading for the government and part which is trading for itself. And I believe only through our vigorous oversight will this administration be able to create the kind of a sandwich where on one side is the President asking for transparency, on the other side is the Congress demanding it, and in the middle is the IG trying to overcome a bureaucracy that has always been able to outlast administrations and chairmanships. Mr. Chairman, today we have to let make sure that this special IG goes back with the clear message Congress will not be outlasted and our patience is running out for the transparency promised by the administration, promised by the Congress, and not yet delivered by the people who transcend administrations one after another. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony of the special IG and I commend you for continuing this vigorous oversight and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for a statement. Um, We will now turn to our first and only witness, Mr. Neil Borowski. Uh, it is long standing policy that we swear all of our witnesses in. Will you please stand and raise your right hand? 
Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. That the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Is the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, SIGTARP. Prior to assuming this position on December 15, 2008, Mr. Borowski was a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York for more than eight years. In that office, Mr. Borowski was a senior trial counsel and headed the mortgage fraud group, which investigated and prosecuted cases of mortgage fraud and also cases of securities fraud with respect to collateralized debt obligations. Notably, Mr. Borowski led the broad investigation into the $55 trillion credit default swap market and is a recipient of the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for his work. We welcome you, Mr. Borowski. Uh, you allowed as much time as you may consume. We generally give people five minutes. We thought about giving you 10 minutes but then I thought about the importance of it, and I said, as much time as you may consume, but try to stay within 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I will, and, and thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, uh, it is members of the committee, it is an honor and privilege to appear before you today and present to you our quarterly report to Congress. In my testimony, I'd like to outline uh, what is contained in our quarterly report, section by section, uh, going over some of the highlights. In, in Section 2 of our report, we do as we do in each of our quarterly reports to summarize uh, what has happened in the last three months in the TARP. Um, we, and this has been a busy quarter for the TARP. We've seen uh, the expansion of several programs, the bankruptcy of General Motors and Chrysler and the extraordinary government support of those industries, uh, the expansion of the mortgage modification program with the selection of servicers and the allocation of approximately $18 billion in support of that program. We've seen paybacks of TARP money, more than $70 billion uh, for of capital purchase program recipients, uh, and the launch of the public-private investment program with the selection of nine asset managers uh, and the commitment to provide up to $30 billion of taxpayer funds to fund that program. And that's all laid out in Section 2. In Section 3, we've attempted to put the TARP program in context. Originally started as a $700 billion program to purchase toxic assets from financial institutions, the TARP has expanded to 12 separate programs evolving up to $3 trillion. But it doesn't stand alone in the support of the financial system from the federal government. Since 2007, um, more than 50 different programs from different agencies have, have been announced, uh, instituted, and implemented. And a lot of what we've seen when, when hearing about TARP recipients um, and their participation is that it's not alone. A bank may have an investment from the TARP, but also participate or issue debt with an FDIC guarantee or borrow money from the Federal Reserve. Uh, and there are so many numbers flying around that we thought to further the goal of transparency, we wanted to put the TARP in the necessary context of these other programs. And that's what we've done in Section 3. And for each of the 50 programs, we put out three different numbers. One, the amount of money that is currently uh, outstanding on each of those programs, which is about $3 trillion. Two, the high water mark from, from their inception until January 30, 2009, which is about $4.7 trillion. And the third number, which is what the total exposure of each of these programs were fully subscribed to, each of the insurance contracts were, were, were used, uh, all of the different programs were, and all the support in total, and that number totals $23.7 trillion. Now, since we've issued this report, there's been some harsh criticism coming from Treasury. I've seen some public statements uh, that attack the numbers in our report as being inflated. Uh, one press comment said that a Treasury spokesman described them as ridiculous. Uh, we take offense with that. Uh, I think that if you look at the report and in context, it's very clear where these numbers came from. They came from the government itself. These are all open source, public source information. This is from the websites of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, submissions to Congress. If the numbers are inflated, then it was the government itself that inflated them, not us. Secondly, as, as far as the suggestion that we are, are trying to shock and awe with this number, again, I think that we've made very clear in this report, in black and white, what this number means. 
We explain that this number involves programs that, yes, have terminated. Uh, we explain that there are that some of these numbers are collateralized, that there is collateral. All of that is set forth in black and white. But one thing that is very clear, the number is basically just the accumulation of what these 50 separate programs are and what the total amount of financial support that the government has committed to. Um, frankly, what this ta attack is, is a, a, a challenge to the basic transparency that we try to provide in this report so that members of Congress and members of the public understand in total what is going on as part of the government's support of the financial system in this crisis. And that brings us to our next section, section five of the report, where we talk about our recommendations. Uh, and one of our, our primary recommendations brings us to the same issue of transparency. Um, we've now been in existence for seven months, my office, and over the seven months we've been pushing, really from my eighth day in my office when I made the first recommendation to push for greater and greater transparency. Um, that recommendation is one that we continue to make today, which is Treasury requiring TARP recipients to report on how they're using the money. Um, Treasury has repeatedly refused to adopt this, rec this recommendation, and as a result, in February, we sent out letters to each and every financial institution to ask them directly to report to us to prove that it is that they can provide meaningful information, that there is a purpose to requiring banks to account for their use of funds. Yesterday we issued that audit result, and the, the evidence is as we suspected. Contrary to Treasury's suggestions, banks can and should be required to report on how they're using funds. Banks reported a variety of different uses, uh, aside from just lending, as, as the Chairman noted, uh, to acquire other financial institutions, to make investments in mortgage-backed securities, to pay down debt, all different forms of use of funds that can and should be verified and can be part of the basic transparency of the TARP program. As we note in our recommendations, this is not the only recommendation regarding transparency that has not been adopted. Uh, we set four different recommendations, including those related to basic concepts, so taxpayers can know what the value of the assets that they are the chief investors for. Um, Treasury receives monthly reports on those valuation estimates, but will not share them with the public. And we, too, think that, too, is a failure of, of transparency. Similarly, we have recommendations related to the TALF program and the public-private investment program, basic concept of transparency. So one, the taxpayers can know what's going on with their investments, and two, the watchful eyes, uh, as, as has been famously quoted, sunshine is the best disinfectant, and it will discourage and deter bad behavior. In section uh, one of our report, we talk about what we've been doing for the past three months, uh, building our audit and investigations divisions. Uh, we're concluding six audits this quarter. We've uh, announced or about to announce five separate audits. Uh, we talk about that. Our investigations division is, is continuing. We have 35 open criminal investigations, um, and we will continue to strive forward with bringing greater transparency to this program. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member I said, it is again a, a privilege to be here today to present this report, which we, we believe is an essential part of, of continued transparency. Uh, we've had uh, more than 12 million hits to our website since we've, since we've started, with um, almost 700,000 downloads of our previous reports. Uh, and I think that we act indeed as in word to bring this necessary transparency. And I thank you for your indulgence on time, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and we really uh, appreciate your being here. Um, I understand that uh, Treasury collects monthly data showing the value of its top portfolio. Is there any reason why that should not be made public? In our view, absent some maybe very, very limited circumstances, we believe it should be made public. Uh, the one argument that was, one of the arguments that was offered against doing this was that it may impinge Treasury's ability to liquidate some of those assets. But, but frankly, we think that just like you know, any asset manager, any mutual fund, uh, the investors have a right to know what the value of their assets are. Frankly, the one good example of when you don't know is, is Ranking Member Ice's example of, of, of a, of a Madoff type hedge fund where investors can't see what's behind the numbers. Uh, and we think this is an essential part of transparency. Right. You know, we um, are concerned now about conflict of interest. Uh, Treasury hired nine private firms to be asset managers. Uh, for the TARP public-private investment program, including large companies such as BlackRock, GE Capital, Real Estate, Invesco, and others. 
All of these large firms are engaged in extensive private investment activities, yet Treasury has refused to require these firms to establish firewalls between their employees and who makes investment decisions on behalf of the government and those who manage private funds. Why, my question is, why does Treasury oppose firewalls at these firms to prevent conflict of interest and collusion? We have been pushing this recommendation over the last couple of months. Um, we have consulted with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which operates similar programs. They have asset managers both buying and selling assets. And even Treasury itself, we have taken a look at some of their programs. And one constant is that when asset managers receive market moving information and have the ability to or know about information to set market prices, a firewall comes attached to that responsibility in every program other than in the PPIP program. Um, we have we've made this recommendation. In our quarterly report, Treasury has, has detailed, uh, I think, in a lengthy letter, their explanation as to why they are not requiring this. In short, they say it is not practical in this program for a variety of different reasons. Uh, we, we strongly disagree. Uh, we think that the taxpayer is entitled to the exact same protection that the Federal Reserve requires in, in its, when it hires an asset manager, and, and we believe the same protections should and must be part of the TAR program. Is there a downside to this? The downside. Treasury uh, argues that uh, they make a number of different arguments. One is that it would be, it may be more expensive. That there may be a limit of to the firms that are willing to participate, uh, absence of all. Um, all of these may may be valid arguments. But from our perspective, when tilting the scales, are the tremendous dangers that come from not having a wall from being able to take advantage of conflict of interest to wildly recognize profits in different parts of the firm to the reputational risk. People are going to ask the question, why does BlackRock operate under a, under a wall when they are managing funds for the Federal Reserve but not when they are when managing for the Treasury? And if there are incredible profits, there is going to be a lot of explaining that needs to get done. Let me, um, you know, I find your testimony quite amazing. Um, do I understand you correctly? Now, uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, does Treasury ask top recipients what they are doing with the money? Do they ask them the question? Overall, no. They have asked, um, they asked Bank of America, Citigroup, and AIG uh, are the only capital recipients that are required to report the use of funds. Some of the other extraordinary assistants also have reporting requirements. Uh, but as far as the rest of the recipients, Treasury says no. And they say they, they, they won't do it because it won't be meaningful. It won't be reliable information. So, of course, the question we ask is if it is a meaningless exercise, why are you doing it with respect to Citigroup, Bank of America, and very recently AIG? And we haven't really gotten an answer to that question. You know, I think it is very, very important because, um, you know, in creating this in discussions early on, you know, it was about job creation. And, of course, uh, I think that we need to have the information to determine in terms of what they are doing with it, because um, when I look at the fact that in the minority community uh, that the unemployment rate is 15.5 percent, and, and, of course, uh, it is running 9 percent generally, so it, it appears to me that that is a legitimate kind of question that should be raised because we feel and recognize that job creation is important. Of, of course, Mr. Chairman, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And what Treasury does is it puts out lending survey information. So it is already collecting information from each of the financial institutions reporting on lending. But as our audit demonstrates, that is only part of the story. It doesn't talk about all the other things that banks are doing with TARP funds, investments, retaining capital cushions against future losses, all these types of things, which, which goes right to the heart of the question that you are posing. Yeah. Let me ask you, did the TARP recipients have any trouble telling you what they were doing with the money? Uh, we had a variety of responses. We had 364 responses, but nearly every single financial institution was be able to provide us uh, with meaningful information on this survey. And I have to remind you, this is a voluntary survey. This, what we are recommending is that Treasury actually require this information. But just, we just asked, and we still got very meaningful responses. Is there any reason why the public should not be told what, top, what is happening with the top money, how it is being used? I, don't, I can't think of one. Uh, the one argument that was presented to us was that it would be a meaningless uh, endeavor. I think our audit report proves that to be false. I think that banks can and should be required to report on their use of funds. I think that 
This Congress can make better policy decisions. Frankly, I think it will assist the Treasury in making better decisions if they have a better understanding of what is being done with funds as, they, as we continue in, this, in the bailouts and the continue of the administration of the TARP. Thank you very much, Mr. Borofsky. Uh, yield to the Ranking Member. Well, Mr. Chairman, before, uh, begin, before I begin my questioning, I am not sure that everyone understands that you came here on a day when others probably would have taken the day off. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is it actually true that today is your birthday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs> That's the power of a chairman, if I've ever seen it. Thank you so much. Well, the coffee will be coming, Mr. Thank chairman. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Now, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just in case anyone thinks this isn't a bipartisan committee, uh, Jimmy Duncan has decided to have his birthday today <laughs> just to make sure there was one on each side. Yeah. Yeah, do your part. And the chairman blew it out without even showing it. It's much harder as you go down the dais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, your coffee is coming. <laughs> Mr. Burr, uh, I'm not sure that I can begin to tell you how pleased we are to have you here today. And, uh, and we're pleased for a number of reasons. And I'll read from that New York Times article, if, you, if I may. Andrew Williams, a spokesman for the Treasury Department, called the figures distorted because they did not consider the value of collateral posted on these loan programs. I'd like you to put into perspective, first of all, did you ever say anywhere in your report or in your findings that we would lose $23.7 trillion? Uh, of course not. And we explicitly point out in the report the, the existence of collateral. So. When you, when you talk about $23.7 trillion or about 30 times as much money as you would have if you gave away $1 million a year from the birth of Christ till today, just for somebody to try to figure out if that is true or not, uh, that quantity of money, what you are talking about is the amount other than the $700 billion, the amount that is essentially under assurances and insurance. Is that right? If every program is maximized um, to, to the greatest extent possible, that, that's what that number is. And, and coming from a slightly different persuasion, I would say even if you went back to the time that Moses parted the Red Sea, you would still be in the right numbers. I think actually Abraham would be, would be sitting here trying to figure it out, too. There's no question. Uh, this is an amazing amount of money that when you look at millions over thousands of years and not getting to that number, it's hard for people to understand. But let's, let's look at it an another way. If, in fact, just 5 percent of this 23 trillion, 24 trillion under assurances of various sorts were to go bad, isn't that a dramatic amount more than we ever authorized or appropriated from Congress? It, it, is, it is, of course, a, a staggeringly large number. The TARP itself is, is, are staggeringly large numbers as they have been expanded through other programs as well. Now, our previous Neil came before us, Neil Kashkari. And we asked him about how much money the assets were worth. And he said he didn't know, but he'd get it to us in 30 days. And 30 days later, he said he'd get us another 30 days. He's gone now. Uh, so you're the one we have. Has the Treasury been willing to cooperate and provide the information as to the current value of assets purchased? Um, they have, we have, this is a recommendation we have made since early February, and they have not yet made this information public. So the assurances made by Neil Kashkari, both in the last Congress and in this Congress, that this was forthcoming, in fact, were not truthful in the sense that it doesn't appear as though they were ever forthcoming to actually tell us in a, if you will, a mark-to-market what the assets are worth, particularly I am interested in in AIG's assets. Do you have any idea how much money has evaporated permanently from the $180 billion that AIG has received? Um, I don't have that, that, that information at my fingertips. We are doing a couple of audits on AIG uh, where we are going to have a better sense and be able to report on what is going on in those portfolios, particularly in, in, in the context of its counterparty transactions. But I don't have that information. Do you think that Congress is overdue to find out how many dollars have gone out in a manner that can never be refunded? 
Uh, I think it's absolutely essential for transparency that, that Congress and the taxpayers who invest in this program know what Treasury's best estimate is as to what the value of their investment is, absolutely. Now, because we own AIG and because there is litigation against the founder of AIG, and you're obviously very familiar with the uh, court decision, and apparently follow-on litigation, do you have any day-to-day uh, -day contact or any ability to find out why we continue to spend, my understanding is over $200 million in legal fees, trying to recover initially $4 billion, which the Court has said we are not entitled to get back from C.V. Star and Company. As a matter of fact, apparently they said it in very short time and said, said that, you know, essentially the case never had merit, but we have spent over $200 million. Is that something that is on your radar screen? We haven't addressed that situation. We have two ongoing audits of AIG, which is, is consuming a good chunk of my, my audit staff. But, of course, we're, we're always going to be continuing to look for follow-up uh, follow aspects. We are also, though, may be included as well in an overall audit that we have just recently announced uh, we are doing on corporate governance as a whole, including the government's role in, in, in governing and uh, as part of an 80 percent owner of AIG. So it may come in, in that context as well. Is there any way that, that we can get an independent assessment of whether or not the Federal Government's pursuit of, of these lawsuits rather than going to binding arbitration, which was offered uh, repeatedly when uh, uh, Mr. Greenberg was born before this committee, is there any way to second get this, guess this as a million dollars a week is being spent on legal fees? I think what we, what we can bring through our audits is an explanation of what the Federal Government's involvement has been in those decisions. In other words, in, as an 80 percent owner, how involved is the Federal Government in making those decisions versus AIG's management itself? Okay, now, back to the firewall question that you have been working on and this committee is very concerned about. Uh, I am a member of a public board. I own stock. My, actually, my foundation owns stock in that. I am not allowed to trade that during blind periods. Is it any different to say that a member of Congress who happens to have a, a foundation which owns stock but also sits on the board as an individual, that would you say that was unwielding to say, no, you can't trade on behalf of yourself while, in fact, you have inside information? Uh, is that any more hard than uh, what you are dealing with with various firms who are being given huge underwriting and huge leverage advantages at the Federal Government's expense in return for trading primarily on our behalf. And, and I think that is exactly the right, the, right, the right difference is here these fund managers can have up to $3 billion of taxpayer money and the whole design of the program is to encourage them to set prices in an illiquid market. This is a remarkable amount of power. And once they have make that decision, it is a remarkable piece of inside information. I think that would be difficult for any member of Congress to replicate uh, because they are actually the design of the program is to set prices. So I think it is a much far more extreme example in, in, the, in the example of the PPIP. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I now yield um, five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, very active member of this committee, Thank Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barassi, it is good to see you again. Have you had have you had a conversation with Mr. Geithner uh, since you took office? Uh, I spoke to him in late January, and that's it. That's it. For how long was that conversation? Uh, it was a couple of minutes before a, a larger meeting with uh, Mr. Didaro and Ms. Warren from the Congressional Oversight the, Panel. The reason why I ask that question is, as I listen to the chairman's uh, questions and our ranking members, it seems to me that you all should be on the same team. To a degree, I mean, I know there's a, a, a wall there, but I guess you know a lot of the things that we are that are coming up should concern all of us. And I want to follow up on some of the chairman's questions. Um, you said a moment ago that you got 12 million hits. That's a lot of hits to the to your system. What that means is that the the, the, the apparently the public is very interested in what's going on with regard to this money. And I think the thing that concerns me is that something that you had said in the Joint Economic Committee not very long ago was your concern about the appearance of some conflicts. Do you still have those concerns? I think my concerns are, are greater today than they were a couple of months ago when I, when I spoke to you in, in the Joint Economic Committee. And why do you say that? Because of the absence of walls in this public-private investment program. I think that 
the danger here of, of, of picking, of the perception of picking winners and losers, of giving these nine economic firms, nine out of the hundred that applied, uh, the ability to set prices and not put the right type of restrictions in place to make sure that they're not going to otherwise profit unfairly at the expense of the market. If these firms do start having those types of profits in other aspects of their, far of their firms, I think the criticism that has previously been leveled at Treasury, the picking the winners and losers, the opaqueness of how decisions are being made, could be potentially devastating to the program and potentially devastating to just the way American people view their government. Uh, so I, it's a very serious concern of mine. This morning uh, on, on uh, Morning Joe, they had a fellow named McDonald uh, who's written a book, and he used to work for Lehman Brothers, and he alleged that Lehman, that Mr. Paulson um, intentionally allowed um, Lehman to fail. Now, normally I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. But what we are beginning to see is, and then he laid out the evidence, and it sounded pretty logical. And I think that when we start getting in these, to, it's, and the reason why I mentioned the 12 million hits is that, and, I've, and, I've, and I really believe this, in order for us to get past this economic situation that we find ourselves in, the public has to believe that we're doing the right thing. And they have to believe, and, and I think one of the things that make them believe is transparency. I, I agree with you on that. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, and, and there's one thing, and one of the things that I can, I'm concerned about is a lot of times when we see a report that doesn't look too favorable, a lot of times we have a tendency to shoot the messenger and not address the report. But there's one thing that you said here that's quite telling. As a former prosecutor, and I guess you're still a prosecutor now, you said something about 35 open criminal investigations. And I know what it takes to even get to the point to start even investigating. Let's assume only five of them have some legs on them. I mean, I mean, are you seeing any kind of pattern? And I think what my concern is is that if there is a pattern, maybe this Congress needs to be doing something. And I'm trying to figure out, is there anything that we need to be doing to give you uh, more power than what you have to accomplish the things that you have to accomplish? Because one thing is for sure, if we cannot get to a point of the American people at 12 million hits, if we can't show them that we are doing the right thing with their money, as the chairman has alluded to, we're going to have problems. We, we, I don't see how we can get past this, because the American people are not going to buy it. No, and, and I couldn't agree with you more, the, the importance of, of transparency for all the reasons that you stated, as well as just the fundamental fact that the taxpayers are the investors. And I think the reason why we see 12 million hats and, and more than 700,000 downloads of our reports uh, is because the American people want to know what's going on in their investments. They want to understand these programs. Uh, and we serve a role basically to translate these programs from the very, very complicated uh, descriptions the Treasury puts out. And we try to translate it into English with tutorials and explanations. Um, so I, I do agree. As to your question about the, the criminal investigations, uh, they're really, th we haven't seen a major pattern. We have a lot of investigations related to the mortgage modification. Um, there's a lot of scams out there, people trying to take advantage of struggling homeowners. So there's, there's a fair number there. But the rest of the investigations really go across the board. We have some incredibly complex securities and accounting fraud investigations of, of banks that either have attempted to or, or actually applied for or received TARP funds uh, that may have lied to the government in order to get that funding. We have cases of insider trading, trading on inside information. They may have learned about the TARP. Um, really, almost any type of white collar crime you can think of, we have, we're, we're touching on our investigations. Uh, really, it's what you would expect when you're putting so much money out on such a short period of time, in many, time with ver many instances with very few conditions. Um, and, and that's, they really do cover the board. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I yield now to the gentleman from Florida. Congressman Micah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Borofsky. Um, let me follow up on uh, Mr. Cummings' uh, questions. Uh, uh, you, actually, you stated that uh, TARP is, uh, and these programs have grown into fifth, more than 50 programs, 50 different programs? Uh, not within the TARP. Within the TARP, there are 12 programs. In our report, we talk about approximately an additional 50 programs that are across the United States government, everywhere from the 
FDIC to the Fed to FHFA. So there are about 12 TARP, but 50 that you are, are you keeping sort of a watch over, or just the 12 TARP? Uh, thankfully, we just have the 12. Um, okay. The rest are being well, are again, in other agencies. Um, it, some of this seems to have dramatically expanded, and probably the the nature of the of the responsibility required some of that. But to get to the point. Um, Mr. Cummings was raising, uh, do you have enough resources to conduct uh, sufficient investigation and oversight? Well, we are building as an office. We, we currently have 70 personnel on board. We are building to about 160, which a target date of, of early next year. I read your, uh, not all of your report, but to uh, scan through it, and, uh, and you do have recommendations uh, in here. I notice only eight of 32 of your major recommendations have been implement, implemented, and then uh, five of 32 partially implemented. Do you, is there any way to enforce uh, implementation uh, or to uh, get us, as, do you have any recommendation that we can put some teeth into what you're doing or recommending? Uh, really, we feel like our role, our statutory role, is to make these recommendations, uh, and that's so really we for ha we have to pick them up, pick up the responsibility. But uh, it appears that a number of your recommendations are not implemented, or it appears that some of your recommendations take a while to get implemented. For example, executive compensation was that I guess that that was finally adopted a rule, June fifteenth. That's correct. So that's why we've seen since June 15th a lot of folks interested in paying back their loans. I think that is an explanation that's been offered. Okay. But it took us, what, six months to get uh, that in place, uh, that recommendation implemented. Uh, that, is that correct? Uh, I think it was about four months from our February report. Mm -hmm. Then I think part of what you said is you're trying to develop and encourage transparency. Many of the things that deal with transparency are, are recommendations that have not, in fact, been addressed by uh, uh, the, the various groups that you oversee. That still remains the case. It does. That's unfortunate. Um, and then maybe finally you could tell me, uh, first I didn't vote for it, but we started out with a, about to, $700 billion that uh, members of Congress thought that they were going to uh, help uh, bail out financial institutions. And then you said it grew, uh, the, some of the liability grew to tr $3 trillion. Maybe you could explain that. Then $4.7 trillion. And then the total exposure is $23 trillion. So how did a little tiny, teeny $700 billion program balloon into uh, $23 billion uh, dollars worth of exposure. And I think maybe you could tell us the, the three trillion you cited level, uh, how far we're at risk at that, 4.7 and 23 is the ultimate. Sure. For, for the TARP, we start off with $700 billion and we, we include a, a chart that gives the, the precise numbers for each program and where they come from. But then that number got expanded to, to approximately almost $3 trillion from other related federal government programs. So for example, the, the public-private uh, investment program, uh, which we have been discussing, is seeded with about $100 billion of TARP money. But then the Federal Reserve and at one point the FDIC um, were going to issue non-recourse loans from the Federal Reserve, that is loans that don't have to be paid back but are posted with collateral. So that ballooned it to? Right. And then also guarantees from the FDIC. You have the TALF program, which has been an up to a trillion dollar program, seeded by 80 or 100 billion dollars of TARP funds. So you have these other federal government uh, entities coming in and supplementing these programs. You have an asset guarantee of $300 billion uh, from Citigroup, which is done partly by Treasury, partly by FDIC, and partly Federal Reserve. So that's how we get to the $3 trillion. Those other numbers are actually non-TAR programs, or the $3 trillion actually in, in the 23.7, it does include the, the $3 trillion from the TARP, but it also includes other programs that have nothing to do with the TARP, uh, other than the fact that they are also supporting the financial industry, and other than the fact that the same institutions that can take advantage of the TARP also can take advantage of these other institutions and at times can use one perhaps to pay off another, uh, something we call, it's, it's something we've been, we've been coined as this bailout arbitrage. So uh, 700 billion 
tree, uh, seeded the potential of $23.7 trillion? I would say the 700 seeded the $3 trillion, and then the other $20.7 trillion really comes from other Federal Government programs that are, that are non-TARP related. Riding uh, sort of the saddle, the same saddle. All for the support of the financial, and, of, of the financial um, Thank system. You. Thank Will you. the gentleman Thank yield? You. Will gentleman the gentleman yield? May, may I just ask, expired. Mr. Chairman, gentleman's is that is. in your report, sir? Is, that, is that what you just stated to uh, Congressman Micah's questions? Is that summarize that stair step? Yes, the the three trillion dollars and, and what is there is all is is featured in a chart in the executive summary. Up to the twenty three. And all of that is set forth in section three of our report with the explanations of what those numbers really mean. Thank you. Right. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Borofsky. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm reading your report uh, about lending, where you talk about uh, how uh, banks have been leveraging TARP funds to support lending activities, and uh, you say on commercial lending, 20 percent of respondents reported they used TARP funding for commercial lending activities. Uh, 17 percent of respondents deploying TARP funds for other consumer lending. 13 percent uh, for small business. You talk about the capital cushion, how uh, some banks are, uh, are basically uh, parking their funds to uh, create a, a cushion against loan losses. Now, I looked at your report, and I want to uh, use that report as a backdrop for a news report that came in today. Now, we went back into the TARP history here. We know the first intent that Congress had purchase toxic assets, which were mortgage-backed securities, we were told keep people in their homes. Well, the administration threw that out the door, last administration. Then we were told we're going to switch the TARP funds to help bail out the banks, direct, ca direct capital infusion. But I think something else has happened here, and I want to make sure it doesn't escape this committee, and I, I hope that you can tell me it hasn't escaped your notice. We're now seeing that we have another switch that's occurred that we actually have the Fed paying banks not to use their, quote, excess capital to make loans. I direct your attention to a news report today which says that banks' excess reserves at the Fed rose to a record $877.1 billion daily average in the two weeks ended May 20th from $2 billion a year earlier. Excess reserves money available for lending that banks chose to leave with the Fed instead averaged $743 billion in the first two weeks of this month. Sir, the Fed is paying banks higher interest rates now to keep their funds parked at the Fed instead of loaning the money to the American people. Is that not true? Yes. And the reason I opened up the book is that on page 142 of our chart, we, of our report, we actually have a chart that, that depicts exactly what you're saying. Tell me about the chart and tell this committee about that chart. It, it shows the increase in, in the amount of money that's being parked at the Federal Reserve over time. We, we link it to one of the Federal, one of the Fed programs, a different program, but a, another program that, that we, do, we do think that there is a connection between the Federal programs and the increased reserves that are being held there. If the banks had not received this direct capital injection as a result of the TARP funds, is it conceivable that they would have, uh, according to this news report, uh, averaging $743 billion in reserves parked at the Fed? Is that possible they could have had that? Um, it may be, but only because of all the other programs that we detail in Section 3 of the, of, of the report. Um, all the other programs, meaning government programs that yes. have helped to sustain the banks, right? It would certainly appear to be the case. See, members of the committee, First, they, first, we started out with being told that money was going to mortgage-backed securities. They did a bait-and-switch on that. Then we're told it's being used to bail out the banks so we could have a loosening of credit through a direct capital infusion. Now, you and I know that there are businesses in our communities who are credit-starved. Meanwhile, the Fed is paying banks a premium to keep their money parked at the Fed instead of loosening it up. This is one fraud after another on the American people. Now, they might use the excuse, well, they're trying to c 
control inflation. Check it out. Unemployment skyrocketing. Businesses can't get money, so they're laying off more people. And we're, we're thinking that somehow we've solved the problem here. I want to submit for the record this uh, uh, report out of the Bloomberg News Service. Uh, and I, I want to ask uh, 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 Mr. Borofsky. Without objection. Uh, thank you. I want to ask Mr. Borofsky. Uh, this money's fungible, as we know. Yes. But, but generally speaking, you would agree uh, that there's just no question that a significant part of the money that's being parked at the Fed right now is government money, that go 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 money from these government programs that Congress created. I mean, I think we'd have to look institution by institution, but I think if we did so, uh, I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I hope that we can get another hearing on this particular matter because this goes to the heart of the entire uh, bailout program. One thing after another, one bait and switch after another. And, and Congressman Kucinich, in, in our audit, I think we, we described the banks have communicated to us this tension as well that they feel that's really right in line with your comments. And that is that on the one hand, they're getting pressure from to increase lending and get this capital out there, but they're also getting pressure from the regulators to maintain the capital and increase their regulators capital Regulators read Fed. The Fed and FDIC, OCC, and OTS. Uh, and indeed, that's what the a portion of the trust tests were. So I, I think that thank is a very real I, dichotomy. I thank the chairman. I thank the chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan, and happy birthday. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy birthday to you, too. Um, Mr. Borofsky, thank you very much for your report. And I read with uh, great interest uh, the story in the Washington Post yesterday where the lead paragraph says many of the banks that got federal aid to support increased lending have instead used some of the money to make investments, repay debts, or buy other banks. I, I read uh, at one point that uh, back a few months ago that the Bank of America had taken $7 billion of the first $15 billion they got and increased their uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we, I, I, we can't hear our colleague. Yeah. And it's Your mic on? We hear him. Your mic on? Yes, it's on. Maybe it's I'm not on. close enough. Okay. Right. It, does, it, does that help? It helps. Um, I read that the Bank of America took uh, uh, seven billion of the first 15 billion they got and increased their investment in the Construction Bank of China. I don't think uh, any of us ever intended uh, that this money be spent in that way. And uh, I think a part of the problem was is that this legislation was rushed through and we weren't given uh, proper uh, hearings on it or a chance to offer amendments and things like that. But uh, I can tell you all of the business people, all the small business people in Knoxville and East Tennessee have been telling me for months that what's being said at the top is not getting down to that level, that what the, the uh, President and the Secretary of the Treasury have been saying under both administrations where they're saying, Lynn, 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 that these examiners on the local level are saying, no, no, no. And in fact is, there was a cartoon to that effect in the uh, Congress Daily publication that we get uh, uh, every day at each of our offices, uh, showing the President and the Secretary of the Treasury urging the banks to lend and showing the banks with huge piles of money, and then these examiners on the local level uh, saying, no, no, no. And, uh, uh, that's, I've heard that from uh, realtors, home builders, other small business people, bankers, uh, from all lines. Um, uh, but I want to read a portion of a letter I received from Robert S. Talbot, who's one of the, who has been one of the most successful business people in Knoxville. He wrote to me, he said, I've never seen anything like this in the almost 30 years I've been in the business world. Uh, and, and listen to this. He said, Whole Rob Investments, that's his company, is the mother company of over 50 partnerships and limited liability companies, all of which are involved in commercial and residential real estate projects. We have been in business uh, for many years and currently own interests in 18 shopping centers and numerous other retail and residential properties. Our loan obligations consistently are in excess of $100 million, and we have multiple lenders with which we do business, large life insurance companies, regional lenders, uh, banks. We are not currently in default with respect to any monetary obligation, nor have we ever been. Our business depends on access to credit, and despite public protestations by our government to the contrary, it has been our experience this year that credit is contracting, is contracting. We have been told by numerous banks that unsecured lines of credit to developers are being frowned upon 
by bank regulators and consequently we have been informed by SunTrust, Mountain Commerce Bank and First Bank that they would not renew personal lines of credit. While Fifth Third did not technically extinguish our line, it was apparent to us that they did not want our business and consequently we are in the process, we are in the process of extinguishing our, our lines of credit with them. This, this is what I'm hearing, except this is a, a, a stronger letter, but is this what you've been finding out in your investigation of all of this? Is this true of around the country or is my area uh, unusual in this regard? Because I'm hearing this from many, many people. I, I think this tension does exist. I think we, we, we've seen it across the board. This, you know, on the one hand, the, the desire for banks to do more and more lending and on the other hand, the regulators desire for banks to build up capital cushions against future losses. And it, it's a very real tension. Well, and I also hear from, I've heard this from many bankers who say that they can't speak out publicly because they'll, they'll uh, receive retribution from the examiners and the situation will grow even worse. Well, we did see this in response to some of our, our survey questions. Banks, I mean, our, our source of information for this is, is the banks themselves who, who have come forward and, and have pointed out and have pointed out this, this, this tension. And it's also, it, it's frankly, it's just, it's, it's, it's natural. The stress test, and part of the, the results of the stress test was to encourage the financial institutions to raise additional 70-something billion dollars. Um, these additions to capital uh, are that. They're additions to capital. Now, capital can be leveraged in certain instances to increase lending, uh, but there is a tension there, and it, it, is, it is one from conflicting policy concerns. I've written the uh, top banking regulators twice to tell them uh, and th those two letters were several months apart uh, to tell them that this situation is occurring in our area and I hope that uh, other members of the committee who are running into this in their areas will also write these regulators uh, because uh, 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 this money is not being used, I don't think, in the ways in which the Congress really uh, intended for it to be used. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Morning. You, uh, sir, you spoke of the extraordinary power placed with the fund managers. Um, but I think you have more faith in the firewall system than others do. Given this extraordinary power, um, the, the almost life and death over so much money and what can happen to other co companies, uh, are, are firewalls enough? I mean, I guess there are firewalls and there are firewalls, but is there anything else that can be done to protect the trust that's put in them? A firewall enough standing alone would not be enough. There has to be vigorous and strict enfor in, uh, enforcement and compliance regimes set up over that firewall. By, Our, by whom? It should be both by the company itself uh, within their internal functions and, of course, by Treasury. Um, what our, baseline, our baseline suggestion where we thought the starting point should be, and just as a starting point, should be what the Federal Reserve Bank of New York does with BlackRock and its maiden lane facilities and with its four asset managers in its mortgage-backed security buying uh, program. We thought that would be a good starting point because they do have walls, they do have vigorous compliance set up by FRB and Y compliance, and that's a starting point. But it, it isn't the ultimate goal. We haven't gotten to that starting point, and that's where that's why our recommendations are, are where they are. But, no, we agree. A wall standing alone isn't going to do it if it's not, if there's not a vigorous compliance regime in place as well. Were you aware of whether these conflicts were discussed when Treasury made these decisions of choosing the nine out of the over 100? Um, our involvement, be, we were not involved in the formation of this program before it was publicly announced. Uh, we learned about it really a couple days before, uh, before it came out. Uh, we became involved during the selection process of the nine managers. Uh, one, of, one of the members of my audit team actually sat in on some of the interviews, uh, and we've been engaged in a dialogue with Treasury, a back and forth on this issue um, since at least early June. And did the discussions of the conflicts of interest and protections that were needed, were those discussed after the fact to you? Uh, We've, we've been on, on, on engaged in an ongoing dialogue. There was a, an amendment, um, it's one of the housing bills, the, it's called the Ensign Boxer Amendment because of, of those two sponsors that actually required Treasury to consult with us in the formation of, of, of these rules. Uh, and they, they certainly have abided by that and there, there has been constant cons consultation. Not agreement, but consultation. Do you have the authority and the desire, uh, I guess, ability to audit Treasury's decision-making process to pick the nine? 
we, we certainly are going to be doing an audit on the conflicts issues and, and many of the issues uh, associated with the, with the PPIP program. We haven't announced it yet because the program itself hasn't hasn't gotten. Uh, Go ahead and do it now. Has, hasn't hasn't had lift off, <laughs> uh, but we we are going to do that. I think, frankly, there would be no way for us to do our job without without auditing. Well, well given the lack of cooperation that you're facing now, uh, how is that audit process going to work? I, I would have to say that when it comes to conducting our audits, Treasury has been cooperative. Um, they've provided the documents that we've asked for. They've made their personnel available to us timely for interviews. So. I, I see no reason to worry that we're not going to be able to conduct our audits as we've conducted our other audits uh, without interference from Treasury. Do you suspect that that could be completed by the time you, you do your next quarterly report and repeat all your recommendations again? I think that by our next quarterly report, because of the timing of the PPIP program, I mean, the final contracts haven't been written. The, the, the time the fund managers are being given to raise the funds is up to 12 weeks, which would take us into the next quarter. I think it's unlikely. We could do a, we, we may be able to do something very quickly depending on what the time frame of the program is, but until sort of all the terms are set and the conditions are set, it's difficult to, to launch an audit. Uh, but we are going to do so. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield five minutes to Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would ask you now's consent to insert into the record uh, the letter that was referenced in Congressman Duncan's uh, uh, questioning. He'd like to have this submitted into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your, uh, your work. This is important work. Thank Taxpayers' you. money is at, uh, at hand, and uh, we have a role and responsibility in government to make sure that it's dealt with in, in a, a responsible manner. Uh, my understanding is that Treasury has formally asked the Office of Legal Counsel and the Department of Justice to opine on whether SIGTARP is subject to the supervision of the Secretary of the Treasury. Can you give us an update as to where that's at, your understanding of that? Um, my understanding is that's, that's, that's where it is. Um, Treasury put in their request. We put in our response, giving our opinion that the intent of this Congress was quite clear that we be a, a strictly independent agency within Treasury. Uh, they've submitted their response to our response. Uh, and the issue is still pending. Uh, other than they're, they're trying to get maybe away from the uh, uh, obligation uh, that uh, SIGTARP puts upon it, have there been any further instances of Treasury attempting to exert control over your office or investigations? Nothing, nothing uh, that even comes to mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that they, they've been generally been cooperative with our, our investigations and audits. And uh, what would be the implications if they were to uh, have control over well, I think that in the IG Act and what Treasury suggests that we, we fit within that, that scheme, the uh, Secretary of Treasury has the ability to shut down an audit or an investigation of the Treasury IG. Um, and we, would, we have a great fear. We think that would be a great threat to our independence if the Secretary had that ability over us. I mean, by way of an example, uh, obviously the Treasury has very strongly worded about portions of our report that they disagree with. Theoretically, could they use that type of supervision authority to order us to keep that out of the report and keep that information from the American taxpayer, from members of Congress? Um, I'm not sure, but we think that those are the types of dangers that we see if we're under the supervision of the Secretary. If that type of authority was asserted, I think that would be a direct threat to really the reason why we were created. Well, and I, I concur with that. I would hope that you would let this body know, and me in particular, if there's any instance or movement towards uh, them trying to exert the control. I think that natural tension of having an independent auditor, auditor come in is a healthy one for the process and the, the uh, viability and the visibility uh, to the American people. Let, let me talk real briefly about the, pers the, the personnel and resources that you have in place. And the uh, question is, do you, do you need more resources? My understanding is that at, at the end of June, you had 60 personnel uh, with plans to get to 160 people. You have 35 ongoing criminal and civil investigations and over 3,200 tips uh, that have come in through the hotline and whatnot. I, I, help me understand what's happening within your department and the, the stress and uh, workload with the, the personnel that you do have. We've, we've been very busy. Um, I, we've put together a really amazing team of auditors and investigators uh, who are, you know. Well, what, are you, are, what are you short? What, 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 what do you need immediately that you don't have at your fingertips? I think right now we're just going through the normal process of hiring and finding the right people. The one thing that we identify in our report is that 
We're, we're projected to basically run out of money uh, mid th mid time through fiscal year 2010. We have a budget amendment request to Treasury uh, to get the necessary money money that we would need to keep going through the end of fiscal year 2010. Uh, we've been working with them uh, to to achieve that uh, as well as OMB. Uh, obviously, if that is unsuccessful, we'll have to come back to Congress uh, and ask for a direct appropriation. But um, Basically, assuming that we get that necessary money, we'll be good through fiscal year 2010. Uh, in my short time that I have left, let me sh totally shift gears and talk about the uh, the value of the TARP portfolio. There's very limited exposure to this. Tell me what you're able to see, not see, and what is the value to the public in having that information? Well, we think it's essential from basic transparency point of view for the members of the public, the investors, to know what their investment is worth. Uh, you know, I think we think of... But how hard would that information be to provide? Treasury is getting monthly estimates right now. So it would just be a matter of so making... So they have the information, but we don't. Making that information public. It's just a matter of flipping the switch. I, I would urge that this committee, I would hope that we would insist that uh, those valuations be uh, made public so that the taxpayers can understand the valuation of their assets. Would the, um, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Is that, is that something that, in fact, you believe would be appropriate for us to consider subpoenaing undercover so that we could at least see what they see once and maybe uh, reach the same conclusion you've reached? Um, Thank you. I don't, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessarily my position to suggest what the committee should or should not, should not subpoena, but certainly if the committee wanted that information, uh, the committee certainly should request it and evaluate it uh, and make, make its own determination. I see my time is up. Uh, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me just say that that's something that we are considering as well. Right. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me add my voice to uh, happy birthday uh, and good felicitations. And I want to thank you for your leadership of this committee. Welcome, Mr. Borowski. Thank you. Um, let me ask a, a question. Just to be, uh, warts and all, is the TARP program working? Has it, in fact, achieved the end for which it was designed? I think that really depends on what your definition of working is. Uh, I think that the goals of the TARP have changed over time. Uh, different folks have different uh, definitions of what's working and what's not working. I think if the goal was to remove $700 billion of toxic assets off the books of financial institutions, that clearly has not happened. If the goal is to increase lending, I think that too, unfortunately, has not happened. If the goal was to avoid a complete systematic collapse of the financial industry, uh, that may very well have happened. Uh, I think that you know it's impossible to look in the crystal ball and know exactly what would have happened absent the TARP. Um, but from what we've seen, from what financial institutions have told us, you know we were on the on the precipice of a potentially potential total collapse, and shoring up the capital may have indeed uh, achieved that goal if that was a goal. Yeah. I I haven't been a big fan of TARP either, but I think you have to give credit where credit is due. I, I voted against the, the, the release of the second tranche, uh, which was the only vote I got to have as a new member of Congress on TARP, because I didn't feel that the accountability and transparency standards were in place. The House, in fact, had a statutory framework to allow that, but the Senate didn't agree to it. But having said that, we were facing a financial, systematic financial meltdown last September, were we not? That is certainly what. Uh in the conducting of our audits and gathering of information, that is an opinion we've heard many times from, from the top regulators as well as members of the industry. And while, there, while, the credit, while the flow of credit may still be impeded, the fact of the matter is stability in the financial system, the stress test on 19 banks, for example, would seem to suggest that some stability has returned to the system that was lacking as recently as last fall. I think we're certainly in a much different situation than we were last fall, and it may very well be that the TARP is, is, is responsible for that or responsible in part. Again, part of the reason why we, we do Section 3 and we talk about all these programs is so that you can have in one place all of the different supports that, that were out there and have been in place, and of which the TARP is, is only a small part. Right. So it's hard to, I think GAO has pointed this out, it's hard to say specifically whether the effect is, is from the TARP or from a different program. But it, might be fair to say that had we not had some intervention of some magnitude, such as TARP, uh, we might have actually faced a much more serious situation. That is certainly the opinion of the people that we've spoken to who were who are there at the time, including Chairman Bernanke and, and former Secretary Paulson. Let me ask, um, $300 billion in TARP funding was invested directly in um, systematically important firms through the capital purchase program, 
the Target Investment Program, and the Systematically Significant Failing Institutions Program. Um, the Bush administration pretty much opposed giving the Federal Government a voting stake in banks in which uh, the Federal Government made equity injections. Do you think oversight and accountability capabilities might have been improved if we had not resisted that? I'm sorry. I, I, I just missed the, the, the last part of your question. I, I said the Bush administration, in, in making those funds available through those programs, opposed giving the Federal Government a voting stake in banks in which it made equity injections. Did we make a mistake in that respect? Could oversight and accountability have been approved, in fact, if we, if, if we had a voting stake in those banks? I think oversight and accountability certainly would have been improved if there were more conditions that were in place uh, and if there were oversight triggering mechanisms that, that accompanied those conditions. There were very, very few conditions put on the, the initial uh, output of, of funds. Whether that particular condition, I don't, you know, I think that's a, a policy decision uh, that increased transparency as we look and see what's happened as we report, hopefully, uh, and convince Treasury to give us an accounting on the use of funds. I think we can be in a better position to make that evaluation uh, and by, by looking exactly what has happened. And that's, that's why we push for transparency, so that, that you, the members of Congress, could make those determinations. You have all the information available to look back and say, hey, next time that we're in a bailout, what worked, what didn't work, what was the impact of the various decisions? Well, let me give an example. Uh, the Bank of America, which is now attempting to back out of the Federal Reserve's ring fencing arrangement. If we had insisted uh, as part of the $118 billion we pumped into BOA that one of the tools would have would be uh, to have a voting stake in BOA in return for that, would that be helpful from an oversight and accountability point of view from your perspective today? Uh, it certainly would have an impact on, on the decision-making process and that. Uh, I'm not sure if voting in particular uh, from our perspective, from SIGTARP's perspective, what difference that would make, uh, although it certainly would make a difference from Treasury's perspective and their ability to, to control the actions of these financial institutions. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Now you will five minutes to inform a chair of this committee, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't want to be redundant because I got here late, so I apologize if I ask questions that you've already answered. Uh, but why do you think the Treasury Department is dismissive of your calculations? I sort of I don't know. I think that it's a I, I, I hate to try to crawl into to the mind of some of the the comments that have been made. I think that if they had read the report uh, in 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 total and have read the some of the charts and pages, they couldn't be saying some of the things that they're saying. Their dismissiveness, their their description of numbers well, that are inflated when well, all the numbers came from them. So well, you, I, I'm not you, sure. You, you you haven't had a chance. I, I I've been told that you've only been able to spend maybe one or two minutes with Mr. Geithner since he took over. Is that right? I had a, a, a several minute meeting with him in January. It was followed by a larger meeting uh, that probably went about 45 minutes that included a number of members of Treasury, GAO, and the Congressional Oversight Panel. Uh, that was on one occurrence in did, late did January. Did he take into consideration your, your, your comments and your positions? And we didn't really have that much time in, in, in that one meeting. Didn't, did you make some suggestions to him? I think we, we conveyed where we were in late January. Uh, at that meeting, he actually announced to, to the press his adoption of one of our recommendations, which was posting uh, TARP agreements uh, on the Internet. So that was some progress that we saw at that time. Well, the, the, the SIG TARP uh, report to Tri do you think he wants to keep any information from the people? you think there's a deliberate attempt to do that? Um, I'm not sure, again, of what the intent is. The effect is information that the taxpayers and members of Congress we believe should have as part of transparency is, is not being provided. You're, 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 you said here, and uh, you probably answered this already, but that the total potential federal government support could reach up to $23.7 trillion. Obviously, there's some speculation there, but it could, the liability could reach that amount. I think the speculation is, is if every one of these programs was fully subscribed to, uh, that that is the total commitment in guarantees. Uh, but I don't think there's a speculation as to what the numbers are. These are numbers that have been provided to us by the federal government. I mean, frankly, every one of these numbers, anyone, any member of the public could go in. It's all publicly available information. Well, if even half of that is correct, we've got a big problem. Well, I think the, the, the important caveat which we set forth in the report is that we don't have $23.7 trillion outstanding right now. Right now, the number outstanding is closer to $3 trillion. Since the inception of the crisis, again, as we put out in the report, the total maximum amount has been about $4.7 
But when you add up all of the different programs, including programs at a time that have been paid back, including uh, ones that may have been canceled, including collateralized programs, the total amount of support, which is what we're trying to capture here, does total $23.7 trillion. You know, we're, we're concerned about uh, uh, the terrorist problem. That's one of the top issues that the American people are concerned about. And I understand SIGTARP has recommended that Treasury require its private fund managers to collect information on whether any of their investors are involved in organized crime, terrorism, or fraud in order pr to prevent such groups from using uh, PIP, PPIP uh, to launder money. Uh, currently, uh, as currently designed, are you confident that the Obama administration has taken steps to prevent organized crime syndicates and terrorist groups from using PPIP money to launder? I think, launder that, I think they're most of the way there, but I think there's a little bit more that needs to be done. Uh, they are requiring these fund managers to use the normal procedures, KYC and different procedures to screen for that information. What we've recommended and what they've not adopted is that Treasury not only receive all the information about all the different investors in these programs, but also have the unilateral, unilateral right to kick one out. To use an example, let's say that a fund manager does all the right diligence but doesn't know that a particular investor, may, there's a pending FBI investigation into uh, them being involved in drug traffic or organized crime or even terrorism. They would accept that, that person, that individual or that institution into the program and wouldn't know any better. But we, Treasury, or our law enforcement partners could run those names in a database, kick something out, and then reject that investor. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to be, tell the PPIP fund manager and say, hey, by the way, we have a pending criminal investigation into one of your clients because it, it might be pending. But I still think it's important that Treasury have the ability to unilaterally knock those types of folks out of it. Uh, and that's a recommendation we've made and has not been adopted. Well, let me just end up by asking this question. The TARP funds that have been allocated by Congress does not uh, reach the $3 trillion level. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're going to ask for another uh, bailout? Congressman, I don't, have, I don't have that crystal ball. Um, do you I, think I, it's going to be needed? Do you think additional funds will be required to meet their obligations or their, or their requirements? I, I, really, I, I really can't answer that question. I don't know. I think it, there's a lot in question of what, what's going to happen in the economy in the next three, four, five, six months, the next year, and uh, I'm just not in a position to what really What would your recommendation be? I, mean, I think right now Treasury has stated that they, they don't need additional funds. Um, so I, I think at, at this point I, I assume that's, that's where we are. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now I yield to a senior member of Congress, not in age, but in years of service, Marcy Kaptur. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and happy birthday. This is just the beginning of your life. Uh, Mr. Borowski, thank you so very much. You have a really important job on behalf of the American people and your staff, and we thank you for that. Thank you. Um, first question, what more can we do to help you do your job? Um, Congress has been amazingly supportive uh, of our agency since, since we've begun, and uh, we really have, I think, all the necessary tools uh, in place right now. All right. Uh, your report came out today. Most members of Congress have not had a chance to digest it and, and take it apart. Would you be willing to come back or your staff and help us ferret out some of the information we feel we still need? in its interpretation, would you be willing to do that? Uh, of, of course, at any time, uh, my staff will be available to brief your staff, and any time this committee or any of the subcommittees uh, want to hear our testimony, we, we will always be available. We are creation of Congress, and it's part of our job is to inform the American people through its representatives of everything that's going on, so of course. All right. Now, you have a hotline, 877-SIG-2009. Your report states you received over 3,000, I think. Uh, 3,200 tips from the American people. That hotline is available to the American people if they work for one of these hotshot companies and uh, they were involved in activity that they've now reflected on, might not have been cricket and above board. They can report that to you, can't they? Yes, and they can also and should also go to our website if they don't want to do, use, use the phone, www.sigtarp.gov. This has been a, a crucially important uh, aspect of what we do. Uh, more than half of our criminal investigations have been initiated by tips from the hotline. So, so people are using it and we really strongly so encourage. So some of those tips are good? Some of the tips are very good. All right. So the American people have to muscle up here as well. And I think the fact it's a you know, free phone number, 877-SIG-2009, uh, people ought to, ought to use it. And uh, this was networked across the country and there's knowledge all across America and we need to pull it together. I can tell you in my region of northern Ohio, mortgage foreclosures are going up 
unemployment is going up, and four businesses told me this weekend they can't get credit, and these are excellent businesses. The system is not working at the grassroots level in Ohio. Um, the, my major, and I voted against uh, the TARP, I voted against the bailout, um, because I thought that it wasn't the right means to resolve a crisis inside the mortgage system. We'd done that before, uh, back in the 80s, uh, when we used marked market accounting, we uh, actually went into the books of troubled institutions using FDIC examiners and SEC accounting, uh, accountants, so you had accountants plus um, bank examiners in there, and the burden was not put on the American people. Uh, this is back when Continental Bank failed in Illinois, when all the banks in Texas went down but for one. So when they came up with this concoction of this particular means, vesting all this power in Treasury and ramrodded it through Congress here six weeks before an election, I have to tell you, I became very, very suspicious, and I still am. And one of my questions to you is, you talk about you've had background in your own life in mortgage fraud. Have you ever had a background in control fraud and systemic fraud? Um, I don't know how much control fraud or systemic fraud, you know, as, 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 a, uh, as a sort of cases are concerned. I've certainly been involved in, in securities fraud of some, some truly, uh, you know, systematically, would, would probably today be considered systematically significant institutions uh, and, and looked at some of the accounting frauds and, and frauds that the, those, those companies have committed. I would urge you very much to uh, uh, look at, of course, the Enron situation, who was hired, the staffing you're going to be doing, and if people at a high enough level, because this goes uh, to the very, um, the highest levels of finance and of institutional structures in our country, and ultimately it had uh, international repercussions. But I would, I would urge you to look at the Enron uh, situation and um, to think about the kind of staff that you might hire up in the additional um, authorities that you have been given. Well, it, it, it's funny you mention that because we just recently brought on, I, I prosecuted the REFCO matter, and we just recently brought on as one of our attorney advisors one of the prosecutors on the WorldCom matter. So, so we are gearing up with that in mind. All right, very good. One of the most insightful people I've read on this is Mr. Bill Black out of the University, I think it's Missouri, Kansas City, and um, he had worked for the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation back in the early 90s. I don't believe he's for hire, but I'm just saying his way of thinking about what went on is, is very, very useful, and I wish to share that with you. I also want, I want to put uh, two issues out there. One is warrants and um, uh, my deep concern about, for instance, Goldman Sachs and their warrants. It's my understanding that um, the American people have the right to 12.2 million shares of Goldman, if, if, according to the numbers that I have. Uh, and Goldman actually has the privilege under the agreement of determining when our taxpayers have to sell those warrants and exercise their rights. So they control the price and they control the timing. I think it's really important on the warrant issue that you uh, examine uh, these warrant po potentials uh, sales prices and the timing of this for the American people because the other day um, uh, the price was $1.60 a share and uh, apparently Goldman was saying, well, you know, we'll sell to you for 122.9. Uh, that difference yields $450 million if we were to sell today. What if we held it for nine years? Nobody's asking those questions as far as I know and I'm very concerned that the American people with Goldman and all these other companies get their money back plus. We have an ongoing audit into exactly these issues on the, the warrant repurchase process. Um, so that, that is something that is pending that we're looking at. All right. And uh, Mr. Yep. Chairman, I just wanted to say for the record, I don't have time to ask on the PPIP program, but um, what troubles me, Mr. Borowski, is some of the very individuals, forget the company names like BlackRock, but the people who were involved in inventing the mortgage subprime instrument. Uh, then moving it to market, changing it from a bond to a security, uh, and then creating the derivative uh, instruments, change the companies they were in, but now they're the same people that have gone to the Fed and they've gotten these contracts. I really think you need to look at people and where they were in the system over the last 20 years and what impact that has had now on our economy and who's in place, uh, uh, in, in my mind, with potential power to cover over some of their own very bad mistakes, uh, and I would urge you to, um, uh, to look at those firms closely. Thank you.
Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, the tune of $23 trillion, $700 billion worth of taxpayer exposure for the bailouts is quite striking and frightening. I appreciate your testimony and your frankness, and um, I'm grateful that the President has not um, uh, fired you like he's fired two other inspector generals. Me too. I, what's that? I said me too. Yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, I do think it is a big concern that the administration is, uh, is choosing to remove inspectors general uh, because you, as well as uh, uh, your colleagues uh, within various inspector general offices across government do a yeoman's task of making sure the, the government is accountable to the taxpayer. Thank you. And with that, I would like to yield to the ranking member the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman. And, and following up on that line, uh, in your current capacity, uh, I'll bring to your attention that, according to the Wall Street Journal, some of the private fund managers selected to participate in the uh, PPIP may have consulted informally to the Obama administration in, in, in writing the PPIP itself. In other words, they wrote what they now participate on, which is not surprising. Additionally, the New York Times reports that uh, BlackRock CEO Lawrence Fink, who has been chosen as one of the PPIP fund managers, is a member of Larry Summers' inner circle. The program lets him select fund managers that use 75 percent of the taxpayers' money and assets. My question to you is, if in fact this and other uh, activities begin to look like a cordial relationship where information is being passed, positions are being given because of friendships of people that go in and out of government. Are you in a position to investigate that? Well, I think that, you know, certainly any type of corruption is squarely within, within our, our mandate. But the points that you raise, I think, go so, so importantly to what we were discussing earlier as far as the reputational risk to Treasury. If, in fact, these individuals had a hand in, in writing these programs, it all becomes all the more important that from a perception area alone that we have the, the tightest and, and most significant ethical barriers and informational barriers and walls to prevent them from taking, a, a, taking advantage of a program that they may have had a hand in creating. Well, Mr. Borofsky, you have been criticized a little bit for this $23.7 trillion as we entered in the record earlier uh, because it partially it, these are assurances and partially because it is outside of the TARP itself. How many IGs would have to be at your table if we were to cover all the guarantees, assurances, promises, underwriting that the government is doing? How many different parts of government would we be dealing with here? Well, if you go through our chart and count up the institutions, uh, I don't have the number at hand, but certainly the FDIC, Federal Reserve, uh, Pension Guarantee, National Credit Union, um, basically a financial services roundtable of IGs. So if we can't fit them all at the present table, and the chairman has not yet said we are going to increase the size of the witness table, then uh, is it fair for us to consider here the fact that when we created your position, we created a position thinking in terms of $700 billion in TARP. Today we are thinking in terms of the financial recovery and oversight process that now has a dozen or more IGs loosely associated, not able to coordinate their activities, at least by design. Do you believe that either yourself or either your position or another position should be created that would be the IG for financial oversight that would be able to bridge all these various IGs so that, in fact, our systemic risk, which is $23.7 trillion of risk, could, in fact, be overseen in a coordinated way? I think the, the most vital thing that, that I have uh, as an Inspector General, being obviously brand new to the Inspector General system uh, coming here last December. But not to the Inspector part of it. No. Uh, is my independence. Uh, the independence is, is the most vital thing uh, for an Inspector General. And I think the problem when you have these, these coalition of IGs, I think it is very important for us to coordinate with one another. In the TARP, I formed a TARP IG Council. So all the different IGs that touch on TARP programs, we meet monthly and we talk about audits and investigations. We have subcommittees. And I think that type of coordination is very good. But I will tell you, we also have, in fact, I will be going on Thursday to a regulatory IG there's a, there's a monthly lunch. So we are coordinating with each other. I, I think putting umbrella over other inspectors general, I think that, that, that okay. almost invariably will, will impinge on their independence. I think we are coordinating and, okay. and should but continue in, to do so. In fairness, since we're seeing you, 
it is important that you be able to give us, if you will, the result of that coordination so that we're looking at the entire financial oversight as we are here today. Let me just ask you one closing question. Uh, in the case of Chrysler, it has been reported, and I believe this to be true, that we've given up uh, $3.8 billion worth of dip financing, meaning we gave them the money out of TARP in order to go through a process. We then sold them and took back nothing in return. Uh, is, is that something that, that needs to be investigated as to whether or not it was necessary to write off nearly $4 billion of the last money in to Chrysler? Yes. Our report, we detail those numbers of what's been waived, both in Chrysler and in General Motors, and what's been received on, on, on the other side, and including a, you know, equity interest. Um, I think that sort of the facts are what they are on that and uh, are certainly open to any, to any fair inquiry as to, to how we got to that situation. Okay. So perhaps it's for us to decide whether it's worth investigating now that you've given us the facts. Yes. Or it is certainly something that we can look into uh, potentially or one of our oversight partners as, as part of an audit as to what that decision-making process was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen from North Carolina, time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Watson. Mr. Chairman, I want to say to you on your birthday that uh, yesterday is the past, tomorrow is the future, but today is a gift from God. That's why it's called the present. Happy birthday, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes. your kind words. I want to get back to the Bank of America, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bayarski, for being here and being so open with us. According to recent reports, Bank of America is now trying to avoid paying billions of dollars in fees to the U.S. taxpayers in return for the $118 billion in guarantees they received from the federal government. According to the B of A, the agreement was never signed, but the guarantees have been announced as part of the assistance they received to complete the acquisition of Merrill Lynch. Uh, do you believe that the Bank of America benefited from increased investor confidence because of the perception that they had federal ring fencing of their toxic assets? I really am reluctant to, to comment on, as Inspector General, on an ongoing negotiation between Treasury and Bank of America. I think that, um, I think that you know, the events are, are what they are on that, but I think we, it may be crossing a line as an agency if we start publicly commenting on, on something that's an ongoing negotiation. So respectfully, I would, I would ask for your permission not, not to now, have to answer that question. We had uh, the former Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Polson, in here for five hours last week. It was like trying to unscramble rotten eggs. And it's very frustrating to us. Uh, has the Treasury Department uh, provided uh, an explanation for why they did not require Bank of America jo to join the Asset Guarantee Program Agreement? Do you know? We haven't gotten that explanation. We, we've been monitoring the, the program yeah. since, uh, since it was its announcement. and. Uh, we, We've got a little bit of information, basically, that, that there's been ongoing discussions. We have an audit coming out, I think, that tracks a lot of the fine work of this committee uh, on the Bank of America and its, its um, participation in the various TAR programs, which we'll be presenting in September. Uh, and I would be happy at that time to come back to the committee and, and discuss its findings if the committee would think that would be helpful. Yes, I, I would ask the uh, chair to hold up a follow-up meeting. Uh, in due time so that we can follow up on some of this because you lead right into my next question I wanted to ask and have you discovered uh, any other large-scale agreements of the federal government uh, which the federal government has entered into with financial institutes without valid contracts to enforce the proper repayment of the taxpayers investments so this is a question that you can keep in mind for uh, our follow-up uh, meeting. I do hope we can set that sometime in the very near future. Uh, also, let me uh, see. Um, in your uh, April quarterly report, uh, you notice the risk of conflicts of interest and collusion vulnerabilities inherent in the design of the Public-Private Investment Program, a PPIP. However, the Treasury Department has declined to adopt your recommendation to impose an informational barrier between the employees who do or do not handle PPIP funds 
at the time these funds, uh, the PPIP fund managers, at the nine PPIP fund managers. Uh, can you comment on that or should we wait for a subsequent meeting? No, 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 absolutely. We, we think that this is a, a fundamental deficiency in the current structure of the PPIP program. Uh, we think that it is absolutely essential that there be an informational barrier or ethical wall that prevents the fund manager's firm from taking advantage of confidential market moving information uh, that the fund managers are going to have. Uh, we think it's a problem and we think it's a deficiency in the program. Thank you. And why do you believe the Treasury Department is unwilling to impose the measure despite having placed similar restrictions on asset managers in comparable federal bailout related programs? Um, Treasury has has, has provided to us, and we've included in our report, a very detailed written description of, of their justifications and reasoning. Uh, in our report, we, we address each of those and, and show why we disagree with them. Um, one of them, that it's impractical, that the design of the program doesn't make it susceptible to such walls. Um, and it may very well be that the, there's, the program is fundamentally flawed in its design, um, you know, in such a way uh, that in its current structure, it may be impractical. Uh, our response is that because this is such an important issue uh, for such a variety of reasons, um, that if, if it's impractical with the current nine fund managers, well then before selecting these fund, nine fund managers, Treasury should have changed its criteria, did what was necessary to put in the necessary walls to protect the taxpayer. Uh, my yeah. time is up and Mr. Chairman, I would hope that in our subsequent hearing with Mr. Bryarski that we can uh, get these recommendations and get some ideas about how you would assess uh, the standard functions of uh, such a department. So thank you. And are we going to recess? No, no. We, we're going to okay. continue uh, all okay. the way through. Um, just to give you an update, the House is in recess, which makes it good for us. Oh, great. That we can continue. Okay. We're not in recess. When the House is in recess, that's where we really do our work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I now yield to the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to join the committee in uh, congratulating you on your birthday. And I, all of us were witnesses to how quickly you blew out that candle. So maybe we can negotiate with Mr. Waxman for a carbon credit for you on that item, OK? Um, first of all, I watched this morning, uh, Mr. Borowski, the way you were attacked for releasing this committee. And I'd just like to say to you as one member of this committee, um, thank you for giving us the hard cold facts. Um, and I just hope that you remember that when you get attacked like that, when uh, basically because you brought a message a lot of people didn't want to hear in this town, contrary to public belief, the ancient Egyptian tradition was to always send your best people to give bad news. Um, because the good, the guys who were sent with the good news were sacrificed to thank the gods for the good news. So it should be a credit to you to understand that you're attacked because you are bringing this up. And I want to thank you very much for that. And, and I'm sure this, um, not just this committee, but the public at large is going to thank you for your report. Uh, the hard cold facts do get into trouble. The, um, speaking of footprints, <laughs> the, uh, the, whole concept of looking at BlackRock and some of these other, the nine players here, where the footprint of the federal government of picking winners in this whole game. Do you have any idea or could, and if you don't and you need to have time, I understand because you can get back to us in writing. How did these nine major players get chosen as the winners in this game to be blessed, not just by the bureaucracy of the federal government, but by all the taxpayers in the federal government. How did these nine players become the winners in this game as opposed to the other losers that were pointed out by um, uh, the former mayor of Cleveland, um, Mr. Kucinich? Um, the uh, Treasury's explanation is that they, they put out applications. They received about 140 applications. Uh, the next step was to remove duplicative applications uh, or incomplete, and that came down to 102. They then applied the criteria which they've put out on their website of what they were looking for in the ideal asset managers. Uh, and basically, those that didn't meet that cut 
Uh, I think they narrowed the number down to 13. They then did a series of interviews, uh, and it ended up with the, the final nine. I think those are the numbers. I, I think the, the exact numbers are, are, are likely reflected in, in, in our report. Um, and that is essentially as treas how Treasury has described their process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just think this report really, uh, again, reinforces the fact that we have ventured into a very, very scary territory, a brave new world where Washington decides what happens on Wall Street and Main Street. And hopefully we can somewhere in the future find a way to uh, have an exit strategy and remove ourselves from imposing our footprint over the rest of American society. And I thank you very much for this report because I think it's a, it's a dose of reality to make all of us work together here. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, and I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you, Inspector General. It's a pleasure to have you before us, and in your short time, you have done an extraordinary job, and, and we thank you on behalf of the American people. Thank you. Uh, let me first ask this question. Did any bank you surveyed not participate by returning the survey? No, we had 100 percent participation. All right, very good. Uh, should we pass legislation to require the tracking of TARP funds since evidently it was not required in the actual providing of the TARP monies? We believe that, that requiring uh, recipients to account for their use of funds is, is a fundamentally important part of transparency. It's why we make this recommendation, continue to make this recommendation. As, as a policy, we, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we tend not to, to cross into the policy recommendations as to what Congress should do or what Treasury should do. Uh, we do say what Treasury should do, but we don't suggest legislation for Congress just as a policy matter and, and to maintain our independence. But we certainly do feel it is our obligation to present to you why we think it's such an important uh, factor of transparency. Now, did the contracts that the Treasury uh, devised with the banks for the distribution of the TARP funds prohibit the use of the money for any purpose? Um, different contracts and different programs. There are some restrictions on stock buybacks on, um, in the capital purchase program, on certain restrictions on um, di increasing the level of dividends. So there are some restrictions, although, although not many. So the fact that they would use the money to make investments, repay debts, or buy other banks was all legal under the granting of the TARP funds? Absolutely. All right. Should we change that? That is a, as I said, that is a real policy decision uh, that, that needs to get made. I think in making that decision, um, we, should, we should take a look at, at both sides of these arguments. And part of the role of transparency as a Special Inspector General is that we think that these debates are, mo are best informed by bringing transparency so we can see what happened. But I can give you arguments that I've heard on both sides of, of any one of these issues, including I think one of the more controversial is, is acquisitions. And I've heard some very powerful, strong arguments that that's actually good for the banking system and arguments on the other side that it would be an inappropriate use of TARP funds. Let, let's but, talk about acquisitions. Which banks actually took the TARP money and made acquisitions? We're going to be publishing uh, in, in necessarily in some redacted form each of the responses that we received. And the reason why I say redacted is that there's some confidential business information that we'd be prohibited by law from, uh, from, from making public. Um, since we're still in the process of that, I'm, I'm reluctant to comment on any specific response that we had. We will be making that, that information public, hopefully, within the next 30 days. And in terms of alarms that go off in your head because of what you have um, been able to ascertain through your surveys, what are those alarms um, that we should be particularly focused on? I don't think that there's any alarming, because I think when we did this survey, we're taking very care, taking great care not to make any judgments uh, for all the reasons that, that I've stated. The most alarming thing to me is that Treasury continues to refuse to adopt this recommendation, even in light of the proof that we ha now have in this audit. Um, you know, they continue to tell us that it is a meaningless survey, even though not no one from Treasury has taken us up on our offer to come look at these survey responses, an unredacted form. We said, come over, take a look at them, and, and see if you think that these are meaningless responses that can provide transparency. So I think the most alarming to me is this steadfast refusal, this uh, willful um, uh, refusal to adopt a recommendation that we think is so important to provide transparency. So you're saying that even though you now have over 360 surveys that provide information on how the TARP funds have been used, no one from the Treasury Department has come over to look at this information? 
No, their refusal to adopt our recommendation was made so, um, purely off of our audit report. They have not come over. I think that's astonishing. Are you back? Thank you very much. Um, I now yield to the, the to Congressman Shulk from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Likewise, happy birthday on your special day. And um, just noticing uh, your election to office in 1983 uh, and someone who's 28 years old in Congress, that's a lifetime. So thank you for your service I feel it to, too. Uh, to, to <laughs> this Congress and, our, and your country. Happy birthday. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, um, I'm specifically interested in the um, change in purpose uh, that has occurred under the new administration with the use of TARP funds and how that might change uh, your role or add additional responsibilities or how your responsibility as the Special Inspector General for TARP uh, interfaces with our federal government's decision to bail out the automakers. Could you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I think that in the, in the near term, we're addressing that through our audit function. Uh, we've announced an audit of corporate governance, which, of course, uh, oversees the fact that we do have a controlling interest in General Motors now, controlling equity interest and minority interest in Chrysler Financial. Uh, my team is going to be heading out to Detroit next week, so my audit team, uh, to start that process. Uh, we're also going to be sending um, representatives our, of our investigative division as well uh, to, to make the necessary context, uh, make sure that the word is out, including word about our, our hotline, if anyone within these, these companies knows of any misrepresentations. There's a whole bunch of reporting that's required as a condition of, of, of the federal funds. So we're going to keep a very close eye and, and dedicate the necessary resources uh, to fulfill our oversight role. So you feel you're be being given the latitude you need in terms of allowing your personnel into GM and Chrysler to oversee the use of those TARP funds? I'll let you know next week, but I, I don't anticipate that we're going to have a problem. Okay. Um, I'm as the next question is your opinion. Um, you know, uh, when this bill was sold to Congress last fall, uh, it was uh, sold on the, the uh, it was predicated on the idea that this money, in the, in the words of former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, would be, uh, if not all paid back, uh, most of it, and there was a slim likelihood that we might actually make money on the TARP money for the taxpayers. Uh, do you believe that the majority of this money will be, pay, be paid back? I think if you look at the, the way the program has evolved, uh, I think it's extremely unlikely that we're going to get $700 billion back. The mortgage modification program alone is $50 billion. There's no anticipation that, that any of that money will come back. Um, that money is being directly given to mortgage servicers uh, to help convince them to, to lower mortgage payments and uh, payments that they'll make on behalf of, of, of homeowners. So I think it's, it's, in, it's very unlikely that TARP will turn a profit significant enough on other activities uh, to generate a profit to cover that $50 billion. In addition, on some of the other programs, um, uh, as, as, as Ranking Member noted, the money has been written off from, from Chrysler. Um, it's still have to see what happens with our equity interest in those companies. So it's certainly possible that more may be uh, retained or earned back over time than maybe even we suspect right now. But I think the idea of getting a, a dollar for dollar return is, would be extremely unlikely. And then specifically about um, your conversation, your statements earlier about asking uh, uh, basically Treasury uh, to detail um, or, or basically to collect information from TARP recipients um, and also the use of their taxpayer funds from those TARP recipients. Um, in your view, why is it, I mean, Treasury kind of gives this response that, well, that would be meaningless and uh, really is not necessary. Um, what's your view of that? Well, first of all, if it were meaningless, well, I don't understand why Treasury does this with respect to Bank of America, Citigroup, and AIG. Um, are they including, recently with AIG, are they including conditions in their contracts that they believe are meaningless? I, I certainly hope not. Uh, my view is that, that, sure, money is fungible, and that is a, a true concept. But just to use a simple example from my own life, uh, I get direct deposit of my federal paycheck. And while normally I couldn't tell you whether one week, whether I, if I buy some groceries, whether it's from one week or a different week, because money is fungible, all goes into my checking account. Um, a couple of years ago when I won the, uh, the John Marshall Award uh, for my work on the REFCO case, there's a small cash component. 
and I knew that was going to be direct deposited into my checking account. And before I got that check, I knew what I was going to do with that money. I was going to pay off a piece of my, my student loan. So when I got it, I could, and, so, and sure enough, the money came into my account and then went out to, to pay off the student loan. Mm -hmm. So sure, money is fungible, but I could tell you with a great deal of certainty what I did with that bonus money, that extra money that came in. And what we see is that financial institutions have been able to do the exact same thing. The TARP was an extraordinary amount of money uh, and an extraordinary investment. And for banks can tell what they did with that money. Banks, they're responsible companies. They're budgeting for the fact they're increasing the capital by these amounts. And the facts, and this is all money that can be verified and, and tested. So much of Treasury's compliance system is based on similar types of self-reporting, where financial institutions report their compliance and then Treasury comes back and hopefully one day will test through its compliance function. This is no different. If a bank says, I used the money to acquire another financial institution, which I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise because I wouldn't have had enough money, that's certainly a verifiable fact. If they go buy a, uh, agency mortgage-backed securities and say this is what we did with the money, we can look at what their, their, their total volume of securities were before the TARP money and afterwards and test that money. So we do believe that this is an important part of transparency. It's important for the members of Congress, for the American people, and it's important for Treasury as well to know what's going on with the taxpayer funds. I agree. Thank you very much for your testimony, and I hope you'll continue to press on. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Shocks, time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Congressman Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barashi, thank you for your, your great work. I appreciate the work being done by Mr. Dodaro and uh, Elizabeth Warren as well. The work that you do obviously allows us on the Oversight Committee to do, do a lot of our work. Uh, let me ask you, uh, one of the programs that Treasury has set up was this Asset Guarantee Program where uh, Treasury will guarantee certain toxic assets held by qualifying financial institutions. They have uh, focused mainly on toxic assets purchased by or held by, excuse me, uh, Bank of America and Citigroup. I think those are the two big outfits that they focused on. Have you been able to get information on the specific assets that, that Treasury has acquired from Citibank and, and Bank of America? We're in the process of putting together an audit that's going to address exactly that question. Uh, we received a, a letter request from Congress to look into that, and we are right now in the process of putting together the audit structure that's going to address exactly that issue of, of what's in there, what the cash flows are, how it came to be, uh, really a thorough audit on the entire process and, and what's going on in, in the Citigroup. For Bank of America, Bank of uh, Ken Lewis has indicated, the, the CEO of Bank of America, that they are withdrawing from that program, that the contract was never signed. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's not actually going to be imposed. So we do have a, a pending audit that we expect to complete in September that addresses Bank of America and its participation in the TARP program. So we'll touch on that there, but we won't be doing a similar study of the assets uh, given, given the change of the status of that program. Okay. I, I know this was instituted in November of 2008, and I'm just wondering, you know, what, what actually was purchased and uh, my, my question really focuses on our, our potential exposure. If we're, if we're pro providing a guarantee behind a, a uh, credit default swap or, or some complex derivative, our exposure uh, may be greater than uh, what your monetary uh, assessment has been, even at, at $3, bill, $3 trillion. And I'm just worried about our exposure there. Let, let me just shift, uh, and I, I certainly anticipate uh, your, your report in September. That, that will be great. Uh, let me ask you about your own position here. Uh, we originally set up the Special Inspector General for TARP uh, in connection with the $700 billion that was, uh, was uh, allocated. I did not vote for that, but, but it, it went through anyway. A lot of us didn't. Uh, now, originally, you, you were set up to oversee uh, and to safeguard the taxpayers' money. However, uh, recently I understand that Treasury has challenged uh, your authority as an independent oversight body. Uh, reportedly, Treasury has requested an opinion from the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel uh, questioning whether your office, in fact, falls under Treasury's authority. And uh, can you comment on Treasury's challenge to your 
independence, which you talked about earlier as being so important and integral to your, to your operation there? Yes, we, we do think this is uh, potentially an issue that, that, that could impair our independence. Uh, Treasury has sought this legal advice from OLC. Uh, we've submitted our own, our own submission uh, detailing our position that we think it's crystal clear what Congress's intent was, and that was for us to be an independent agency operating within the Treasury Department. Uh, and we're going to wait and see. But we think that there is a, a danger that Treasury uh, could try to assert, uh, depending on what the OLC opinion is, the authority to shut down uh, investigations or audits that we may, may seek to initiate. And we think that would obviously be contrary to the intent of Congress, uh, and it's something certainly we'll, we'll let Congress know if we do get an adverse opinion. I'm pretty confident, though, that I think the statute is so clear and the intent of Congress is so clear I'm hopeful that OLC will, will see it the right way. I think really the only way uh, that, that makes sense based on how the statute is written and what the statements of Congress have been both at the time of enactment and since then, and, and hopefully this issue goes away. I, I always thought this was an unnecessary thing for Treasury to do. I continue to think so. Well, obviously, if this challenge is, is diverting the energies of, of your staff to defend itself, then perhaps we in this committee can uh, I mean, there are some vehicles that are, that are going through Congress right now. We could simply amend uh, one of those just to clarify that our intent was that you be independent and that you uh, conduct oversight over the, the uh, operations of Treasury with, in connection with this, this TARP program. Let me ask you, I also heard that uh, Treasury's decision to, to challenge this uh, came immediately in response to questions regarding the bonus payouts at AIG. Is that correct? That was the timing. Uh, I, I would, wouldn't go so far as to, to do causal relationship between the two because I don't know for sure. Uh, it, w it did come up, uh, the issue, on the eve of an interview that we were going to have with a member of Treasury's General Counsel's office uh, who was involved in the executive compensation um, issue at AIG. So it certainly was at that time. Well, I only speak for myself, and I know my time has expired, but I just want to say that I, I think it would be a terrible uh, miscarriage of what Congress's intent was to have you uh, hamstrung by being put under Treasury. We, we, we established your office to oversee uh, and, and to protect taxpayer money, and, and we do not expect you to be answering to Treasury. We expect you to be investigating them and, and conducting your oversight. Thank you. I yield back, right. uh, Mr. Chairman, and you happy birthday. No, you can't yield back. You don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Fortenberry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Borofsky, welcome. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. You've made the news with $23.7 trillion pronouncement in your report. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you to unpack that further. Uh, that clearly, obviously, is the fullness of potential of taxpayer liability, the exposure, potential exposure to taxpayer li liability. Uh, I've been, many of us have been operating off a working assumption that that total taxpayer liability was about $12 trillion, uh, that between the Fed and the FDIC as well as the uh, Treasury Department uh, totaled about $12, $12 trillion. Now, the other number that I thought was significant that you, you said was about $4 trillion of that is actual realized expenditures. So two questions, and let's just try to break this down into categories that are manageable. Tell the American people where that taxpayer liability uh, is located, to whom it is, uh, who, to whom it has been gifted, basically, and then, again, under the $4 billion uh, actual realized expenditures, to whom is that going and in what form? Direct expenditures, loans, guarantees, by whom, to whom? This, your, your question actually encapsulates why we put this, made this an entire section of our report, because it's, it's obviously some, some very, very complicated issues here. And in section three of this report, we do that breakdown. Um, we, we talk about each of the numbers that, that we're talking about, the, the three trillion that's currently outstanding, the 4.7 trillion that has been expended or guaranteed uh, in total, including money that's been paid back and canceled programs, uh, 
from the initiation of the crisis through June 30th. And then the 23.7 trillion number, which is the maximum number if every one of these programs was subscribed to, to the, the, the highest amount, every guarantee was done. And, and the purpose of this uh, really wasn't to make the news or, or to make a splash. What we did here is we took the 50 programs, because we thought it was important to show what the 50 programs were, in addition to TARP, that, that address the government's support of the financial system. And really, this $23.7 trillion, which has generated so much controversy and so much comment from the Treasury Department, is just adding up the number of, the, of what the total highest high water mark is for each of those 50 programs. And, and, and that's what's reflected in here. So it isn't that the taxpayer is on the hook right now for $23.7 trillion. We, we don't say that and we don't suggest it. But that is the maximum if you take all of the programs that have been initiated since uh, the inception of that, the financial that's the crisis. total potential exposure. But again, let's, let's get back. Let's try to frame that a little bit more concisely. Uh, I, this is 250 pages. The particular section you're referring to, I don't know how many pages is that. I don't know if you have a particular chart that, again, categorizes this in broad terms so that uh, we can all uh, have a working framework that uh, is usable uh, so that we can understand, again, the total liability that exists and actually where it's going. Table 3.4 on page 138, and I would say that any, any taxpayer or, or anyone interested, this report is at our website, www.sigtarp.gov, uh, where anyone can download this and, and, and see all the facts. But if you look at page 138, that has a, a table which is entitled Incremental Financial System Support. And, and what we've done here is we've taken um, there's been some existing programs that were increased. So we haven't included the total program, but only the, the increase that is attributable to the financial crisis. Um, and what we have here is it lists the different sources of, of where the guarantees or support are coming from and lists what the current balance is, the maximum balance uh, from inception, and what the total potential support is. And, and that's the phrase I think is the right one, is total potential support. Now, each of these entries in here, and we list the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, Treasury TARP, Treasury non-TARP, and then others, is supported subsequently in, in the report by other charts. So for example, if you wanted to see what the, the Federal Reserve uh, portion of this is, you just turn the next page and in Table 3.5, we list each of the Federal Reserve programs that's described, and again, with the same information, the current balance, the maximum balance, and the total support related to the crisis. And what you do when you add up each of these charts and the total support, that's where the $23.7 trillion number comes from. Now, out of this, about $16 trillion is between the Federal Reserve, Treasury, and the FDIC. Again, the operating assumption that we've been working off of for, the, for basically the balance of this year, because there was no numbers available, easily available, was 12. And so that's a very significant increase. And that's why, what's one of the reasons why we've done this? And we, we've, we've come under some, some some criticism for having done this, but every time that we would look at a different article or a different newspaper, there'd be a different number there. And we thought it was important to put the TARP in context to, to collect what the, what the major numbers were. And, that, and that's what we've tried to do here. What level of detail do, do, does it go into in terms of actual recipients uh, of these various funds between FDIC, Treasury, as well as the Federal Reserve? Well, we had a page limit, so um, and because ultimately this is this is TARP in context, and given the number of these programs, what we've done is is really a one or two paragraph summary of each program. Um, that that further information, and also everything that's in here is based on publicly available information. This is all stuff that we got off the websites or congressional testimony of the different agencies. Uh, getting into the recipients uh, would be is I think in a large part would be in many cases beyond what's publicly available and frankly beyond our jurisdiction or authority because these are non-TARP related. Uh, the gentleman from Nebraska's Thank time Thank has you, expired. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brosky, for, uh, for the work that you're doing and for being here today. I just have two lines of, of questioning that shouldn't take too long. One result, uh, concerns the term asset-backed securities loan facility, the so-called TELF. Um, this is an idea where, where they need a, a AAA rating from two of the rating firms and a not less than AAA rating from the third firm. But we continue to have these rating agencies paid by the issuers, by the people whose product they're, uh, they're rating. Now, you made mention of that in your report. You, you said essentially they are, and I quote, paid by the issuers of the very securities that they're rating. As a result, 
the agency has an incentive to issue a high rating to attract future business from that issuer, close quote. And that's one of the problems that got us where we are today in this whole financial crisis. It should boggle our minds that we're continuing down that path and then even relying on those as part of this program. So you would agree, obviously, that we should be concerned about this, but more, moreover, what do you suggest we should do as a, as a different methodology for the TELF program and others? Well, this is something we've been pushing through for since our, our, our first initial report to Congress in February. And, and we, we have some suggestions uh, in the report. One of, one of our concerns is a race to the bottom. Uh, Moody's has actually came out, one of the three rating agencies, and have, has said basically that they're losing business because they've been more strict than the other two and as a result they haven't been getting enough business. Now, we haven't investigated that. We, we, we think that the Federal Reserve and Treasury needs to investigate that, that further. But it sort of raises the ultimate issue of, 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 of a potential race to the bottom. And then it was expanded. When, when the TALP went into commercial mortgage-backed securities, they added more rating agencies but kept the number at two that are required to get approval. That to us only exacerbates the issue of more rating agencies for that race to the bottom to occur. I think what they need to do is what the Federal Reserve, to their credit, has started to do, uh, which is stop relying on rating agencies to do the work, the diligence, uh, the underwriting uh, that stands behind these asset-backed securities. So Federal Reserve has hired a collateral monitor for commercial mortgage-backed securities to come up with its own evaluations as to what these things might be worth in, in a stressed environment. And we think that it's important to keep pushing in that direction. Uh, away from reliance or the importance of rating agencies in this process to make sure when we're dealing at least with taxpayer money um, that the level of protection is a little bit higher than what, as you correctly state, got us into this soup in the first place. What, what can Congress do to help you push that point? Because obviously if we're not going to have somebody other than the issue of pay, then we should do exactly what the Fed is uh, doing in this program. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think that you know, it's, it's not really our policy to advise Congress on specific no. legislation on these policy issues. But, well, but saying that legislation but, would be the only thing we could do or one of the things we could do or whatever would be helpful generally. I, I, think, and I think it also is sort of worth noting that in, in the regulatory reform that obviously this Congress is, is considering, uh, taking a good hard look at what the reforms are for the rating agencies and whether the reforms truly and squarely address uh, these conflicts of interest that had such disastrous consequences leading Great. into the financial crisis. Thank you. My other line of question has to deal with the uh, credit derivative contracts that AIG held uh, with third-party counterparties. Um, the financial situation when it occurred obviously created uh, a situation where the counterparties claimed that the contract terms had been violated. Uh, they demanded either payment or additional collateral from AIG. AIG's lack of uh, liquidity obviously made that difficult uh, to come up with, and there was a contest between AIG and those third-party uh, people as whether or not there was money owed, if so, how much should it be, and, and there was a negotiation that was going on on that. When Mr. Liddy from AIG was before the committee, we asked him why it was they paid 100 percent on, on the claim, and he said that he didn't believe they necessarily should have, uh, that in fact there was a, a, a contention amongst that, and he had been somewhat surprised, but he and the people at AIG hadn't done it, that in fact it had been the Fed and, and the New York uh, branch in particular that had done it. Are you looking at that at all, and are you able to tell us uh, what happened that all of a sudden in contested claims they just up and forked over 100 percent? We are. We are looking at that. We have a pending audit into that very specific issue, the credit party payments and the, uh, the payment of 100 cents a dollar and, and who made that decision. I expect that audit will be, will be finalized uh, by September. Great. Thank you very much. I yield back. Did the gentleman yield? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, just one quick follow-up. Uh, are you familiar with the XBRL and are you in a position to help get this kind of transparency database access available to r agencies that currently are not reporting in a transparent fashion? Uh, we are familiar with the XBLR product. I heard some testimony about it and when actually my office received a presentation on it um, and it, it does appear to be a, a, you know, a useful type of product to, to, to track these types of funds. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Right. I yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Congressman Issa for the letter that he gave to me. You know, we had uh, Mr. Uh, Paulson and Mr. Bernanke uh, before the committee just uh, a couple of w in the last couple of weeks, and uh, they had uh, uh, an epidemic of memory loss on a number of issues. 
And Mr. Paulson was working, of course, very closely with Mr. Geithner, the now Secretary of Treasury, on a number of issues, as well as Mr. Bernanke. And you know, th this, this whole pattern really kind of bothers me about how they've, they've appeared to keep things from the Congress of the United States because they can't remember who did what on the, on the uh, Merrill Lynch deal with Bank of America, and now Geithner's worked with Paulson, and now they're in effect threatening you. I mean, I, I don't see how anybody can get anything out of this letter that we received other than they were putting the hammer to you to back off. Uh, you say here that uh, on April 15th, uh, Mr. Knight wrote to the uh, OLC over at the Justice Department attaching a copy, a copy of SIGTARP's uh, April 7th memorandum regarding the presented issues. And they were asking whether or not you should fall under the jurisdiction or control of the Treasury Department. It's pretty clear, I think, everybody on this committee that you should be independent because that's what your job is. But. Uh, then there was some kind of correspondence between you and uh, the Department of Justice, and they asked you to redact a portion of the email uh, exchanged from OLC. Was that was to you, right? Um, initially, all, I think all of the information that our correspondence that we oh yes, I'm sorry, yes, the response from OLC to us, um, which then generated an additional response from Treasury. Yes, well, that was the, we were uh, asked to redact that. Why, I wonder why they ask you to redact that. Did they give you a reason? The stated reason from OLC is that it was um, the information was indicative of their current thinking on an uncompleted matter. Uh, therefore, that it was it was privileged information, and that until they came to a final resolution, uh, they didn't well, want. Well, you know, I I've, I was chairman of this committee for six years, and I worked with the Justice Department on a number of occasions, a lot of occasions, as a matter of fact. And they didn't give any information out or send any correspondence whatsoever that would have to be redacted. And and, and the reason they didn't is because until they made a final determination, they didn't want any information out there in the hinterlands. And so when they sent you this information and then they tell you that, uh, that, that it has to be redacted, uh, it seems to me that that's, that's once again working with the Treasury Department to kind of hold, a, put, uh, to keep the hammer on you and hold, uh, hold things uh, in abeyance so that she'll walk the chalk. You have any comment on that? I really can't. Uh, I didn't think you could. Unfortunately, you but. Could. Uh... You know, I think this is, this is such a blatant attempt to intimidate you, and I am so happy that you contacted uh, Chairman or Ranking Member Issa and, and Senator Grassley, because what it's done is it's illuminated this issue so that these people that are trying to slow you down and not let this information get out in the public domain, they're going to be threatened by this right now. The only thing I would admonish you to do is to watch your back, because you, as I understand it, sub are subject to the uh, President, and, and the President, you serve at his pleasure. And so I think, uh, you know, there could be some reason they could come up with down the road that would get you replaced. But in the meantime, I want to congratulate you for having the intestinal fortitude, and I'd use some other terminology if I wasn't in public, to, uh, to stand up for what you believe in. I think it's really great. I'm glad you have sent this letter to Mr. Issa. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. And, and I can assure you and I can assure this committee that I will not spend a single moment worrying about my, my job security or my future. Uh, I'm just going to continue to do the job that I've been hired to do, which is bring the, the complete transparency as possible and continue to audit and investigate to the best of my ability. I have not met you before, but I like you, man. Thank yeah. You. Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Would the gentleman you know, yeah. I had a, I've had a tough couple of days, so I appreciate that. I'll be happy to. Yeah. One, one follow-up question. You know, I, so much has been said of this $23.7 trillion, plus or minus a trillion here or there. But because constitutionally we must authorize and appropriate monies, it, wouldn't it be fair to say that we need to have the transparency so we can anticipate in each fiscal year the likely outlays of additional money where risk is beginning to become recognized? Wouldn't that be something that, that this, this committee has to be able to access if we're going to allow the appropriators to make those funds available, presumably because additional losses may still occur in a number of markets, including the housing market? I, I have to confess that I don't have uh, an intimate knowledge of the emergency authorities that were invoked by the Federal Reserve and, and to a certain extent by the FDIC in, in, in authorizing the, these, these maximum amount and what Congress's role is, is for authorizing them. So I'm, I'm not really sure what, what 
what well, the constitutional assu assuming that we is. believe that uh, currently, do we, in your opinion, are we getting that information? Assuming that we believe we should appropriate monies in the years in which the loss occurs. Well, I think from a looking back perspective, we've done our best to bring that information um, you know, to your attention to the best that we can based on publicly available information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say before I yield to um, uh, the, the gentleman from Missouri, uh, I like you too. <laughs> and let me just say that um, um, uh, you also serve at the pleasure of the Congress as well. And I don't think you have a problem because the President has said that he is for transparency. Every conversation I've ever had with him, he talked about the importance of transparency. So to me, you should be in good shape. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and happy birthday. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman from Missouri, Congressman Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy birthday also. Um, I'm afraid this is making me even older. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Borowski, thank you for being here, and I look forward to your insight on questions that are asked frequently in, uh, in Missouri's first congressional district. Uh, I did not agree with the original thrust of TARP and uh, am still troubled by some results that I see. One of the most important reasons for the legislation was to provide liquidity for businesses and homeowners uh, as the ultimate benefit of shoring up the banks and investment houses. Uh, we are seeing large banks and investment houses experiencing exorbitant profits, but no relaxation of credit, no significant increase in liquidity. Why hasn't liquidity been restored to small businesses and individual consumers uh, as a result of stabilizing these lenders? And do you find that too much of the monies and profits are invested in Treasury bonds rather than in monies made available for lending? I think that the, the, the lack of transparency and the failure to adopt our recommendations regar regarding requiring the recipients to report on their use of funds makes answering that question almost impossible. Until we know uh, with some degree of precision exactly how the financial institutions are using the money, it's hard to answer the question of why they're not using it to increase lending because we don't know what they are doing. In our survey, our audit report, which, is, which was just their, their responses to our survey, you know, we've got a lot of answers that, that lead to, can lead to some conclusions. But that, that survey, of course, was, was from a certain point in time, uh, basically March of this year. The banks that responded to the survey, 75 percent of them said that they had not yet allocated or spent all of their TARP funds. Uh, since the time of the survey, another 200 institutions received TARP money, including insurance companies, uh, which frankly I don't think anyone expects is going to be using the money as part of their banking subsidiaries that entitle them to receive TARP funds. So it's very difficult to answer the question of why are they not increasing lending if we don't know what they are actually doing with the money. And the only way we can get that on a more timely and regular basis is if Treasury adopts our recommendation and commits itself in deed as well as in word to maximum transparency. In your uh, crystal ball, uh, do you suspect that they are perhaps paying out uh, lucrative bonuses or paying off debt? I mean, what do you think is happening? Well, based on what we saw from our snapshot back in, in March, they're certainly using it, a certain number are using it to pay off debt uh, and different types of debt, some down paying down lines of credit with the Federal Reserve with TARP funds. Uh, one smaller institution reported to us that in substance they were, they were planning on using the TARP money in, for, one, uh, for one purpose, I think it was to increase lending, but right around the time they got their TARP funds, they got called a line of credit that they had with another financial institution called in. And they ended up using substantially all of the TARP funds to make good on this money that they had borrowed from another financial institution that they might have had real trouble paying back but for the TARP funds. So we get glimpses, uh, at least from the dates of our survey, uh, as to what happened. Well, uh, on, on another subject, how do you see the uh, private program of AIG, the systemically significant failing institution program, as having worked? Uh, to the advantage of the taxpayers. AIG is the only company to receive funds under this program. We, we own 80 percent of the company, yet allow fire sales of the most valuable assets which are on the insurance side of the company. Why do we do this? 
that's a question I think is, is better addressed to, to, to Treasury uh, than to myself. Um, it's hard to calculate what would have, it's, it's very hard to go back into the old, the old Wayback Machine and, and know exactly what would have happened if we had not bailed out AIG the, through the Federal Reserve or, or through Treasury and what the, the implications and, and ramifications would have been. Um, certainly from some folks' perspective, those who were responsible for the bailout and those at AIG uh, warned that the consequences would have been disastrous. Uh, but it's, of course it's hard to really know, to go back and, and know exactly what would have happened. Um, what, we, what we have to do and will continue to do in our audits of AIG is to try to bring transparency to that decision making process uh, and transparency to what's happening over there. And we're going to continue to do so. Uh, who, who do you think are the recipients of these below dollar deals? For, for AIG, for, for, for the AIG. sale of AIG assets? Yes. Um, I think AIG has disclosed some of their sale of assets, uh, and I, to the extent that they have, those are, are uh, included in our report. Thank you so much for your answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield to Congressman Drehaus. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me echo my colleagues in wishing you a happy birthday as well. Uh, Mr. Brosky, th thank you very much for your testimony. I, I share. Uh, the opinion of many of the members of the committee that you should, in fact, uh, be independent and, and that uh, if there are challenges with Treasury, we should certainly be addressing those because we value your independence and we certainly value the information that you've provided us here today. Um, I, I too, uh, like many of my colleagues, am uh, astonished by the potential exposure uh, that you have identified. And uh, I guess I take a little different view. And I go back to how this may have been prevented and am astonished uh, that so few people are willing to look at the inaction and the failure of regulation uh, to work properly uh, to prevent the almost collapse uh, of our financial markets. Um, uh, I, I at the time was not serving in Congress last fall uh, when the markets nearly collapsed, but I said at the time that I would have reluctantly supported the TARP. Uh, if only to stabilize the financial institutions. I, I subsequently voted against the second tranche of the TARP because it didn't include many of the conditions on transparency um, that so many of my colleagues have talked about here today. But I, I go back, uh, and, and I go back to the failure uh, of, of Congress, the failure of previous administrations to regulate mortgage-backed securities, to regulate um, CDOs, to, to regulate CLOs, um, and uh, while at the same time the banking industry was suggesting that they are the most regulated industry uh, in the country and, and there wasn't any need uh, for us to move forward. And many of these same folks that are complaining about the exposure are also uh, working against uh, regulatory reform in financial services. So I, I'm, I'm struck by some of the comments that have been made by, by some of my colleagues. But specifically, uh, I'm, I'd like to pursue a line of questioning regarding some of these toxic assets and the valuation of the toxic assets. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that I think was very interesting when they talked about collateralized debt obligation and the fact that you know, this was related to the mortgage-backed securities, which of course allowed the predatory lending to happen. But trying to pull all of these assets apart and value them in any real way is a Herculean task because there is so little that is actually, in terms of collateral, in terms of capital, that's actually behind them. Uh, how do you, uh, from your perspective, when looking at these toxic assets, um, how do you believe we can best value them? I, I think that I, I too read the Wall Street Journal uh, article and I, the, the pulling apart of one of these CDO squared, uh, and I think it was it was a great illustration of. of the problem of these unbelievably complex securities and, and the challenge that Congress has in, in creating the right type of regulatory reform that will ensure oversight so that these types of transactions, these types of products uh, don't wreak the damage that they did. I think the valuation issue is, is a very challenging one um, and I think it's one that at, at first instance has got to be done by, by the Treasury itself uh, to the extent that they have uh, these assets in on their on their books, whether it's through it's through an asset guarantee of Citigroup, um, whether it's in its own collection of assets, uh, at, 
it's, it's a very complicated structure that, that needs a, a great degree of expertise and I think a great degree of skepticism. We we'll also have to see what happens um, with the other programs when whether these, these complex derivative products uh, start coming across and being, you know, in, in the actual purchase programs or, or other subsequent TARP programs, where I think that issue will come even more to the front. I, I realize um, your function is in evaluating uh, the way in which the TARP monies are, are being spent. But as you look at it and as you look at the causes of, of this financial collapse, um, can you offer advice as to moving forward? Uh, the type of regulation and the type of products that we should be looking to regulate as we move forward? I think that one is a little bit outside of my lane. I think I would be uncomfortable offering opinion uh, on that because I think it's, it's when it gets to the core issues of regulatory reform, I think, you know, it, it, it's fair for us to, to identify some areas like the role of credit rating agencies because we're, we're seeing that. But I think when you get into the, the nuts and bolts of regulatory reform, I, I would be uncomfortable offering my it, opinion. Is it fair to say that much of the exposure that you have identified is due to a failure to, to regulate appropriately certain products? Uh, I don't think that short of an audit product or short of a, a more thorough examination of these causes, I would feel comfortable offering that opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to the ranking member from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm just going to close. I realize there's a second round, but uh, uh, we'll, on our side, we won't be we asking for it. We, we would thank uh, Mr. Borofsky. Borofsky. Uh, we will eliminate that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the fact is that you've been very generous with your time, and you've given us a lot of food for thought. I just want to uh, close briefly, first of all, by thanking the Chairman. Secondly, by asking the Chairman, would he consider bringing the uh, Treasury Secretary here to next to help c close the loop on a lot of these areas of transparency that I think Treasury deserves an opportunity to tell us from their perspective why they have not yet implemented these. Chairman raised a good point and we would definitely look into it. And finally, in closing, I want to echo your words. Uh, when you said, indeed as well as in word, President Obama promised us an unparalleled level of transparency and it's very clear that the bureaucracy that stands between President Obama and what he has told both the chairman and myself and us is in the way. So in closing, and we look forward to having you back here again in a quarter, but I want to thank you for doing everything you can do to bring that level of transparency. And for myself, and the chairman has already said for himself, we want to promise that we will be your partners in bridging that bureaucratic nightmare that always exists between a president like President Obama who has promised us transparency and the Congress who begs for transparency, the IGs who in fact help produce it, and the bureaucracy that stands in the way. So you have our support uh, on a bipartisan basis. You will continue to have our support because we agree with you that, trans that transparency, this light, is the only form of disinfectant that's going to prevent government waste. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for this uh, series of very good oversight hearings. And I thank our witness and look forward to seeing you in about 90 days. Thank you. Back. Thank you very much. Uh, I now recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this and we appreciate your endurance, uh, Mr. Borofsky. Um, I wanted to just state for the record that at least this member and many of the people she represents believe that this is the largest transfer of wealth in American history that we've ever seen uh, from those whose equity has been moved to Wall Street institutions that now have become even more concentrated uh, as a result of of what has occurred with the meltdown in the uh, financial sector. And um, I just wanted to, um, again, share information. It's interesting to me that some of the companies like BlackRock that are involved in the resolution are headed by individuals who were heavily involved formally when they headed other companies in inventing the subprime instrument itself. And we don't know where they did all of their handiwork necessarily, but I find it very interesting that then now the federal government rewards them in very non-transparent uh, processes. And I've said to myself, could they well be handling paper that they invented and trafficked 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Um, uh, the derivative instrument itself 
uh, I understand was heavily influenced by a gentleman that is now the vice chair of PNC. And uh, at our home in Ohio, I've just received a notice that our certificate of deposit that has been with National City Bank come this November is going to be transferred to PNC. I don't want PNC owning our meager assets. Uh, that isn't my choice. And yet I see this having an impact. Ohio now is only left with three money center banks. National cities disappearing. And I see this power gravitating uh, elsewhere to the very people who caused this problem uh, in the first place. One of my questions really has to do with Freddie Mac. And I could concentrate on Fannie Mae and FHA because basically what's happened is all the bad paper is being dumped on the taxpayer, as you've well noted in your report, in different ways, putting it here, here, and every place else in the federal government so it's not easily traceable. But if one looks at Freddie Mac, which is central, uh, in terms of being a dumpster as well as an enabler uh, during the 1990s. Uh, let me just ask you why, it, when I looked at your report, I couldn't find the word Freddie Mac. Why have Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's paper been hidden behind the walls of Oz over at the Federal Reserve? Uh, do you have any role at all in unwinding the role of Freddie Mac in all of this going back into the 90s? We don't have uh, we don't have jurisdiction over Freddie Mac in yeah. in any aspect other than the fact that Treasury has hired them as a financial agent uh, to help do compliance for the mortgage modification program. Uh, but otherwise, because other than that, since Freddie Freddie Mac is not uh, involved in TARP specifically, we don't have jurisdiction over them. I don't know if you're aware of this or if the public is aware of this, but uh, Freddie Mac had over five hundred million dollars of fines placed on it already for fraudulent activity. And the um, fact is that they had, during the um, heyday of their um, nefarious activity, uh, blown up profits over 30 percent on their books. They underestimated risk, and they've begun to pay a heavy uh, price for that. I um, am very interested in your opinion as, a, uh, as an auditor do you find it rather interesting that we can't get at that paper, even though the American people are the recipient of all the mistakes? Our mortgages aren't being worked out at the local level. J.P. Morgan Chase is the worst foreclosure in my district, including through one of its affiliates called Plymouth, all right? And yet they can dump their paper, uh, and theoretically, a lot of it moved through Freddie and Fannie, and yet, behind these walls of the Fed, we can't get at that. And so I'm saying to myself, as I look at a capable individual like yourself and your staff, you're never going to get at the truth. Because they divided up the turf in such a way that you can never tell us the whole. How do you respond to that concern of mine? How do we get the whole truth? I mean, I think that it, it should be no surprise at this point that I, I agree wholeheartedly that more transparency is better than less. Uh, that the more information that is out there for policy policymakers and the American people, the better. Um, we, because it's not related to a TAR program, there's, there's, it's, it's outside of our, our scope and our jurisdiction. But, sir, you're saying it's unrelated, yet the Fed has just hired, I believe, BlackRock to help to um, resolve, whatever that means, the uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae paper. And let me just quote from the Washington Post. Um, Freddie Mac's alleged manipulation and accounting errors caused it to understate profit by 30.5 percent in 2000 and 42.9 percent in 2002 and to overstate profit by 23.9 percent in 2001. These manipulations include transactions that shifted windfall earnings into later periods when it might have been hard for the company to meet Wall Street expectations. My point is I don't see how we can know the whole truth and this troubles me, Mr. Chairman, because even the, the Seeger report today, Seeger TARP report today, is so, there's so many agencies, it's like they've divvied us up into a thousand pieces, just like they did the derivatives, so we can never know the truth. How do we get our arms around the hole? How do we do that? Can you think about that? I think that the question is, is, is best addressed uh, to the Inspector General for the Federal Reserve, as well as the Inspector General for, for HFA, uh, excuse me, it's a long morning, FHFA. Uh, who oversees the conservatorship of, of Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and 
they would be in a better position since these things are under their jurisdiction to, to help right. help you find the answers. From a, a, from a federal government standpoint, <clears throat> are you disallowed from working together? Oh, no, no. We do coordinate together. Um, I, uh, both uh, the, those inspector generals are both on part of my TARP IG council because right. they do have actions that, that impact the TARP. And I'm part of the Financial Regulatory IG Council, uh, and we do talk and, and, and do coordinate with one another uh, where our interests intersect. Here, this is sort of apart from the, from the TARP program, so I, I don't really have a, an ability to go in and, and look at that information. Gentlelwoman's time has expired, Chair. but I think she makes a great case as to why the Inspector General should have independence. And I agree, when there's $23.7 trillion is at stake, I think that you know uh, it's important that we make certain that they are independent. Uh, let me thank you, Mr. Borowski, for your testimony, and I appreciate the interest of the members who attended uh, today's hearing. Earnings at the largest bank and the bank holding companies such as J.P. Morgan, Goldman and Sachs are up, yet lending remains down. It is unacceptable that profits go up while lending goes down. The taxpayers have invested very large amounts of money in these banks. But what have we gotten in return? It remains unclear. The taxpayers deserve to know how their tax dollars are being spent. <clears throat> the Treasury Department needs to publish full and detailed information on the use of TARP funds and publish the value of TARP portfolio on a monthly basis. They have that information and they should make it public. Moreover, Treasury also requires the largest banks to file monthly reports showing the dollar value of their new lending. That should be made public also. If Treasury does not put this information up on its website, this committee will. And if Treasury does not turn over this information voluntarily, Secretary Geithner will be brought before the committee to explain why not. What we have heard today convinces me that one of the best things Congress did when it created the TARP was to also create the Special Inspector General to oversee TARP spending. I can now understand why the Treasury Department would like to rein in SIG TARP, but we are not going to let that happen. You've heard from the members on this committee today in terms of their commitment. Again, I thank our witness, Mr. Borowski. Finally, please let the record demonstrate my submission of a binder with documents relating to this hearing. Without objections, I enter this binder into the committee records. And without objection, the committee stand adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Borowski, for your time and the information that you shared with us. Thank you. Committee Thank adjourned. You. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. In a few moments, Senate debate on...